of the morning bullring on Speed 51. And I got a special guest. Look at that. Brandon Ernest uh, from Ernest Performance alongside of me. He just griped and complained for so long that he wasn't on the 51 Unfiltered podcast. We let him on the show just for a little test run a couple of weeks ago. Then he bailed on us in a late emergency call. I was calling him while coming up the highway, driving back from Pensacola last week, and he said, I couldn't do it. I had some sort of business or something to uh, to attend to on Monday morning last week. So now you finally make your appearance, the big one, on the desk. You know, who knows? Maybe you can be a replacement for Casey LaJoy. Maybe, maybe <laughs> he's uh, he you know he's obviously not here like he's supposed to be. So we'll just take it over. Yeah, look what happened to uh, Drew Bledsoe for the New England Patriots back in the day. You know, Tom Brady came in sub for Drew Bledsoe and Sayonara Drew Bledsoe. Just kind of the that way it goes. Out well, <laughs> yes, it did. I would say <laughs> <laughs> Casey LaJoy uh, not with us here today. He's actually driving up the road. Either that or he's still sleeping in the hotel right now on his way back from the big Rattler. Uh, yesterday at South Alabama Speedway. We'll talk about that. We'll have an interview with Giovanni Bramani. Gio, Long Island strong. That's right, Long Island gang. Uh, very strong yesterday in the middle part of Alabama. So uh, big kudos to them, uh, including that Anthony Campy Racing team on the big victory there. Uh, but, uh, you know, this time of year, and I know you love stick and ball sports so much, they call this time of year March Madness. Okay, NCAA basketball tournament starting this week. Uh, number one, are you going to watch anything? Is that the one where they use the bat to hit the ball? No, no, they bounce the ball and put it in the hoop. Um, I have no idea what that means <laughs> or what they do or who plays or nothing. So you don't have a dog in the fight at all? I have no clue. Well, Casey LaJoy would be proud because I'd say uh, go Tar Heels. Anyway, um, March Madness, we had a little bit of a different March Madness uh, this past week. Just a lot of craziness going on in uh, short track, you know. What do you take out of everything that is going on, good, bad, or ugly? Um, I take that Gio won the Rattler, and I think that was the best part of the weekend. Yeah, it was a good part of the weekend. He definitely yeah. uh, beat, but uh, obviously a lot of other stuff on the line. And you're, you're, oh, you're talking about yeah. Doug Colby winning Myrtle Beach. No, that no, was no, no. Awesome you're too. taking yeah. away Madison Mabry's news here. Yeah. You're taking well, away all her news. I'm just I, trying to help. Obviously, a lot of talk about the entire engine situation going into there. Uh, you know, you have a company, Ernest Performance. Uh, obviously, you know, you are, you know, in the middle of everything in terms of, you know, performance on these race cars and how they handle. Uh, is that why you're trying to be quiet here? Put you on the spot? No, it's not that. It's just that I really don't feel like I'm qualified to speak on it. I, I don't know anything about the inside of an engine other than when it comes out the oil pan. That's really bad. That's all I know. <laughs> um you know, it's obviously an unfortunate situation for the racers, uh, you know, one or two day notice, whatever. I think it was two days, but, you know, obviously that wasn't ideal. Um, you know, Ricky Brooks does a great job as the tech inspector. Jeff Hamner and his company do phenomenal jobs building engines. I'm just I'm just some somewhere in the same atmosphere. I definitely am not qualified to speak on that. Well, we'll have Ricky Brooks on the morning bull ring uh, coming up a little bit later on in the show. I think it's time to find out what happened this weekend, though. Time to find out what's in the news here on the Morning Bull Ring. And for that, we're going to cue the music. Time for the news and Madison Mabry. That's right. We kicked off the weekend down at South Alabama Speedway for the Rattler weekend. Connor Okrezik sat on the pole for the baby Rattler, but it was the fit, or excuse me, it was Casey Roderick who pulled off the win. So the Georgia boy. boy Finally got a win down at South Alabama Speedway. That was on Friday, but on Saturday, a new winner, Giovanni Bermonti, was the, had a stellar performance in the Anthony Campy machine and beat Harrison Burton for the big Rattler win. I was actually down at Myrtle Beach Speedway for the um, NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour season opener. There were a lot of heavy hitters down there. Always a great showing down there for a lot of the Northeast guys that come down the ch for the championship and try to make a championship run. Um, Justin Bonsignor was pretty fast in practice, but it was Doug Kobe who set on the pole and ended up in victory lane after a roller coaster of events down there. Um, Lucas Ull, Dirt Late Models, got rained out at Atomic Speedway. That's kind of been rained out um, before. So they have postponed that until April 11th, but they did get to go racing down in Brownstown in Maryland.
Bishop pulled off the win over Devin Moran over there. Over at the West Coast, we had a couple of winners. Carson Macedo picked up his first win in the Kyle Larson machine at Chico Speedway at Silver Dollar Speedway. And then Logan Shuhart pulled off another win at Stockton. And, of course, that was World of Outlaws. See, you're so excited about your World of Outlaws, you forgot to tell us even that it was the World of Outlaws. I know. I love the World <laughs> of Outlaws. I, it just comes naturally to me. That's I, right. I love talking about it. There was a lot of racing action this weekend. Um, there was some more modified action down at Caraway SMRS. Raced on Sunday, and Matt Hirschman picked up the win there. He raced at Myrtle Beach also. He did not really have the showing that um, I think he expected, but he was able to pull off another win down there. Typical big money Matt. That is right. Uh, the Southern All-Stars, they were supposed to kick off their season at Cherokee Speedway a couple of weeks, but once again, that rain kind of took away from it. Um, so they kicked off their season down in Florida at Southern Raceway. Neil Baguette won on Friday night. And then Casey, or excuse me. Woo, I lost trying to train of thought here. Yeah, Casey Roberts, I did have it right. Snug away with a victory on Saturday. Um, let's go a little bit more into some dirt late model steel. Lancaster Motor Speedway had the Carolina Clash. Uh, Michael Brown swept the weekend. He won the crate feature on Friday and then won the crate and feature crate and super feature on Saturday as well. So he completely swept the weekend at his home track. Plenty of racing around America this past weekend for sure. Madison Mayberry, we appreciate you joining us on the Morning Bull Ring. She'll be back at the top of the next hour uh, with uh, some more updates and uh, what went on during the weekend in the world of short track racing. One guy who has his finger on the pulse of short track racing, our editor, Speed51.com's Brandon Paul, now joins us on the PFC Performance Hotline. And uh, welcome to March Madness, Brandon. Thank you. And it, it was kind of, I think it's a proper name for the last week or so uh, of news in the short track racing world. So uh, it's not just on the basketball court, but I think we have some uh, madness of our own on the short tracks right now. Obviously, a lot of talk, a lot of discussion, a lot of banter on social media, which honestly can be, you know, very bad at times. Oh, what was your take on how things played out last week with this engine situation heading into the Rattler at South Alabama Speedway? Well, I mean, obviously there's there's a lot of factors to it, and we saw kind of all of those factors come out throughout the week. Um, I guess I'll just kind of set the stage for those who, who maybe aren't aware um, of what exactly is going on with the Hamner racing engines uh, within the super late model world. So, Basically, Wednesday, uh, the Sealed Engine Alliance leaders, um, otherwise known as Seal, uh, came out and basically said that they were going to be placing a restrictor on the Hamner racing engines uh, based on a dyno test uh, conducted uh, in Tennessee, uh, and that was following the Snowball Derby. They took a bunch of engines following the Snowball Derby from different manufacturers uh, to compare the performance. And uh, according to Seal, the Hamner racing engines, um, or him, the racing engines outperformed uh, these other engines on the dyno test. So, so their reasoning uh, to put this restrictor on those engines uh, was to even out the competition and, and make it so that all these engines were on a level playing field. Uh, so that's part one. Uh, part one of the story was there. Um, the next day, uh, we caught up with Justin Ortel, the owner of Hamner Racing Engines, uh, who, who kind of criticized the SEAL program, said it isn't, uh, it wasn't exactly what it was supposed to be. Uh, there was a lot of stuff that was in black and white and that he was going to try to work with Ricky Brooks and, and kind of get that program, um, what he considered to be back on track, uh, just for the, for the whole good of the super late model world. Um, and he also stated that the changes uh, that were made to his engines, to the Hammer racing engines, were all approved by SEAL. Um, that's what he told us. But then on Saturday, uh, we spoke with Ricky Brooks, and Ricky Brooks, in fact, said that those changes were not authorized. So we sort of have some he said, she said sort of thing there uh, with the changes that, that were supposedly made to increase the performance in, in the Hamner racing engine. So that's kind of where we're at um, as far as the, the future of the program and the, what's going to happen. 
Uh, Ricky Brooks came out on Saturday and kind of said that that right now the options that, that he's considering is they're going to have to either take all their engines back and put them back to what they were in 2011 when they got these baseline numbers um, on the engines, or he even mentioned the possibility of Hamner losing uh, the program or losing their ability uh, to be involved in the SEAL program. So, so right now it's kind of that's where we're at. Obviously, Rookie Brooks, we're going to be have we're going to have on the show later today. So, uh, I'm sure we'll maybe hear some more about that and, and what went on this weekend at the Rattler. But definitely an interesting uh, and very uh, controversial uh, situation we're in right now. It was definitely a hot topic uh, all week long from that announcement right throughout the weekend. Uh, no matter where you turned, uh, whether it was Speed 51, uh, Matt Weaver was reporting a bunch of stuff as well as a lot of heated discussion on social media and by the way just for the record a progressive engine won the rattler with giovanni bramani and by the way congratulations to you too because uh you tuned the shocks on that anthony can't be racing machine yeah i appreciate that uh geo is actually one of my favorite drivers because when he was hurt he still went to the racetrack every week with his team and worked on the car and cooked them guys hamburgers on the grill he just wanted to be involved in it you know so i think a lot of people can learn from that nowadays yeah and, and actually the funny thing is uh, down at the snowball derby when we went back i think it was for the snowflake uh, anthony campy's team had been parked next to my camper all week long and, and all of a sudden I, I show up and there's a christmas tree out there and i'm like what what the heck is going on and, and uh, geo actually went to the store wanted to get in the holiday mood for the team and bought a lit Christmas tree and put it, you know, it just shows the character uh, of the young man out of Long Island. And I think he's a superstar. And speaking of that, Brandon, uh, he is one of those we talk about in the short track draft presented by PFC Brakes. That stock can rise with some of the races just prior to the short track draft. And I believe Geo is a perfect example of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't believe it watching yesterday. I mean, Looking, looking at our staff picks that we do for, for all of these big races on Speed 51, I mean, everybody had Ty Majewski or Harrison Burton, Bubba Pollard, and rightfully so. And for Gio to, to go in there, obviously he's with a good team when Anthony can't be racing, uh, but for him to go in there in his first super late model start, his first time back in a race car since a uh, back injury last season that has sidelined him uh, for the end of the season, and to come out there and win – one of the, I would probably say, top 10 super late model races in the country. Um, that, that's a huge deal. Uh, he, he obviously has a lot of momentum right now with that win, and I think you're going to have a lot of eyes on him now, especially considering the drivers that he beat to get to victory lane yesterday. Uh, I, can't, I can't help but think that, that his stock is going to rise uh, exponentially enter, entering the short track draft. All right, first to you, Brandon. I got Brandon and Brandon uh, here um, on the line this morning, uh, so I'm, I'm going to get confused. Brandon and Brandon, that's, that's kind of interesting. Anyway, uh, Geo, <laughs> stock rising, of course, but would you put him in your top 10 in terms of 25 years or younger in terms of eligibility for the draft? Would you put him in your top 10 right now? Well, I think if you go back and consider what he accomplished in the pro car before he got hurt and missed, you know, probably the prime of the season in reality, the snowflake, you know, the derby, everything that's going on, speed fest, he could very well be an, a sleeper for number one, in my opinion. I think the kids, I mean, if you watch him, he raced door to door with Ty Majeski, who we know how great he is, Harrison Burton, we know how great he is. I mean, he went door to door with them guys and, and he beat him. So I think he could be sleeper for number one. Not only Brandon uh, is Brandon saying that he might be in the top ten. He says he might actually be a threat or a sleeper pick for number one. Do you agree or disagree? Uh, I probably disagree with number one. Um, I think he's a top five candidate for sure. Um, honestly, I haven't had the time yet to really go through and, and see, but I, I think we have probably – um, I think Ty Majewski is probably going to be back in the draft, um, depending. I didn't hear is he eligible? The weekend, I believe it was Bill Roth over the public hold, address hold, system. Hold, hold on, Brandon. Uh, at South Alabama Speedway. Brand, Brandon. Say something about. Oh. I got to ask you, is he eligible? Mark Keeler and I were talking about this, and, and Brandon is, uh, turn your mic on, Brandon is actually saying no as well. So what is your take, Brandon? Why? Well, 
I would want to look at the documentation again. But I mean, <laughs> being so he's an Xfinity driver, he's not eligible, right? Well, is he an Xfinity Series driver this year? And that's why I say I have to go back to the documentation because I don't remember exactly how it's worded. But. So, so Brandon knows a lot about the rules, and he can fill us in because I made the rules, but honestly, from year to year, i got to be refreshed on the rules just like any good competitor. So, Brandon, you're saying Ty Majeski is eligible? I would – well, like I was about to say, it depends if he announces any plans to race this year. If he – if he isn't racing in the NASCAR Xfinity Series or the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series this year, uh, and uh, plans have not been announced as we speak right now, I would say he's eligible because he's back into the super late model world. And I think we did kind of the same thing with a guy like Austin Terrio when he went and, and did his six or eight race deal with Junior Motorsports a few years ago. Um, once, once they get back in short track racing, if they don't have a ride, they should, they should be eligible. Well, I mean, a uh, precedent has been set. Austin Terrio, even Stephen Wallace back in the day, uh, they kind of you know lost their rides or whatever and became eligible. But I, I think, Mark Keeler, that we might need to go back to the war room that we did years ago because I think the rules might have changed at that time in the terms of I think we might have said at that time that if you lose your rookie eligibility in the big three, you lose your eligibility for the draft. But like Brandon said, uh, that might have been negated or we might have missed the rule with Austin Terrio. Yeah, and I can't remember which driver it was that we were talking about in the war room, and it was that first war room that we did. And I thought, if I remember correctly, which oftentimes isn't the case, but uh, I thought that it, we went on rookie eligibility. So you could start three, four races or so in those uh, big three, but if you lost your rookie eligibility and you weren't eligible in those big three, then you were considered uh, you, you were a big three driver, whether you had a ride or not you weren't eligible to go back in the draft. So we're going to have to go back and uh, look at some footage there from the war room and see what we did. You know what we might have to do? We might need to form our own committee and then come up with the eligibility of, of the draft and stuff and just make the rule, you know, uh, maybe a couple of days prior to the draft. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Brandon Paul, that, that was just a fun joke, okay? Bottom line, we're here to talk about short track racing. We appreciate you joining us on the morning bullring. Uh, what do you got coming up? What are you looking into in your crystal ball, Brandon? Well, I mean, I'm personally, I'm looking forward to Richmond. Uh, I've never been to Richmond, so I'm looking forward to going down there and seeing a lot of guys that, that I normally cover up here in the Northeast with the Pro All-Star Series uh, race for the first time this year. A lot of those past North guys, and obviously the sport type modified. Uh, I think that's going to be a good show. Uh, this weekend, this coming weekend, uh, we have the makeup for the, the March Madness at Cherokee. Uh, I love watching those dirt late models from Cherokee. Uh, I was actually, I went to that event probably four or five years ago uh, when I was down there and, and really liked that racetrack. Uh, it's an awesome facility. If, you, if you're listening and you haven't been there and, and have the opportunity, uh, definitely check it out. So those are two uh, the next coming weekends that, that I'm really looking forward to, to either watching it online or, or watching in person. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to this weekend, this Sunday, March Madness. Yes, March Madness is not only basketball, but on the racetrack, the dirt late models of the Southern All-Star Series will do battle in that coveted race at Cherokee Speedway just over the border from North Carolina to South Carolina. Brandon Paul, we appreciate you, as always, kicking off our show. Have a good show. Go Duke. Oh, you had to get that in right at the end. We have a little Duke UNC rivalry. You wouldn't know anything about that, but uh, we're going to march on. We got plenty to talk about here. Coming up on the other side of the break, we're going to try to wake up Casey LaJoy since Brandon Ernest is in the house. Casey LaJoy is not here. We're going to crank call him, wake him up, get his thoughts on the Rattler.
pod for the third time this week. Brandon Shepard, he wins all four World of Outlaws events. Scott Bloomquist! The big win in the Pro Late 100 tonight. Timmy McCready in the World 100. Chase Hardy wins. Speed 51's Video Network, where the battles are legendary. Get the full picture on short track racing. We'll take you behind the scenes. Um, he's just a meathead. He's always the same way. Your track, your driver, your sport, your passion. Dirt, late models, modifies, and more. Race highlights, recaps, interviews, and thousands of on-demand videos. Speed 51 Network. Short Track Racers home for the best video coverage. Hey race fans, download the new speed51.com app today. Breaking news, feature stories, the unfiltered podcast, live race coverage, schedules, and more right at your fingertips. Download it today on iTunes and the Google Play Store. Uh, if you're just waking up right now, you see that graphic. It says our show starts at 7.30. Not true anymore. We are at 7 a.m., and that's really because we always ran into overtime. Now, Brandon Ernest was here a couple of weeks ago, and he said, what time does the show start? I said 7.30. He says, you mean 7.45? We were on time this morning, Brandon. Way too early as well. <laughs> um, yeah. So you, you're really like a dirt tracker at heart. You don't like to get up early. Um, not at all. Do you need some coffee? You, you're so much more interesting when I talk to you on the phone. You, you've been like kind of dragging this morning. But I got to be honest. We're, we're going to get warmed up here. It just <laughs> takes a little while. Um, I normally get up about 830. We're two hours early. So it takes a little while to catch up. Yeah, but maybe but, I do need to start drinking coffee. I don't actually drink. coffee. Yeah, neither maybe do I, I. start. Yeah, Mark Keeler drinks coffee, but when he does uh, on the way back from Indiana, you got to stop like six times, you know, for bathroom breaks. So, is it coffee or is it is it um, the monster? Red Bull? <laughs> Which one is well, it? Well, no. Yesterday morning it was definitely the coffee. Yeah. But but I did good because that last trip where we I went and then we were going to leave and I said you know what wait a minute let's not get in the car because I'm going to have to go again in about two minutes and he just kind of laughed but I was right and we didn't stop the whole rest of the way home we went three and a half hours without stopping so I'm kind of proud of myself for that one. It wasn't three and a half just FYI. Yeah, it was. No, it wasn't because it was three and a half when we stopped when you took over the driving chores. It was way more than that. No. I took over at twelve. No, it wasn't actually. <laughs> I looked at how, how long we had left, and I'm like, well, this is about halfway anyway, so it's okay. It was actually two and a half. You went two and a half. I'll give you that. You went two and a half hours okay. without having to go to the bathroom. <laughs> All right. I, I'll take that. I'll take that. I'll take anything I can get at this point. You can never. I told him, listen, back in the day, okay, there was a driver in the Northeast, Joe Mamalito. He was a Long Islander, um, you know, local modified driver, uh, ran on the NASCAR Wheel of Modified Tour, and I remember my parents let me go with him at one point. And we had the, you know, the, the cube van and, and the trailer behind it. And I said, hey, Joe, and I'm like a 15, 16-year-old kid. And I said, hey, Joe, uh, you know, are we going to stop soon? I, I, I got to go. And he's like, uh, oh, we don't stop. You see that funnel right there? It's got a tube outside. Go ahead. That's right. That's right. It's good times. <laughs> good times. So that's, I'm like, oh, I don't think I'm going to do that right here. But, but at the same time, uh, racers are racers. They need to get to the racetrack. So if you ever, you know, want to get to the racetrack, quickly don't invite mark keeler on the well no, i can tell you when when i do when i'm by myself the uh the monster hydro bottles are perfect size okay or, or the eight ounce uh, gatorade i can't believe you so hey it believe. works and you don't have to stop so okay anyway uh onwards and upwards uh, giovanni bramani the teenager out of long island with a great victory yesterday. Unfortunately, he's on a flight this morning, and he could not join us on uh, the morning bullring. Uh, he has to fly back to New York, uh, probably got to get ready for school and so forth. Uh, but what a comeback. And, and, yes, indeed, that was his first super late model race. Uh, I did look, uh, Mark, as, as Mark Keeler and I were listening to 
listening while in the car. Uh, the broadcast on Speed 51 of the Rattler 250 yesterday from South Alabama Speedway. We both looked at each other when we heard Bill Roth and, and Ryan McCullough allude to the fact that Giovanni Bramani had not run a super late model race yet. And, and we knew that he was supposed to last year. Uh, but then, of course, he got injured uh, on a dirt bike and, and, and had just an unbelievable comeback that he had to make. But he never did make that start. So first start, super late models, big race, big platform, Rattler 250. He was the winner. Casey LaJoy caught up with him yesterday in Op, Alabama. All right. Same by with Giovanni Bramani. The Rattler 250 is over. You've had a chance to calm down and collect your thoughts. Uh, first of all, how do you process all this? Such a big win for you. Uh, it's just really a dream come true. I'm just so happy to be here and uh, to be in victory lane is just crazy for me, especially to be back um, from my injury and after not being in the car for nine months. I really uh, like the super late model and I'm excited for the next race. Yeah, talk about that, your back injury. First of all, explain what happened. Uh, we talked to you a little bit at the Derby, but give everybody a little refresher what happened and kind of what went along with rehab for it and what it took to get you back in a race car. Um, I was doing a wheelie down the driveway on a dirt bike. and uh, That's real safe. Yeah. I did the whole driveway. Um, I have it on videotape, and then at the end of the driveway, there's a downhill, and uh, I got flung about 20 feet, and I was knocked knocked out unconscious for uh, about four hours um, in a concussion state of mind not remembering things and uh, after that I had to wear a back brace for six months so I was out the out of the car for like eight months and uh, now I'm back and I'm excited to be back uh, you know what how was the the rehab process I know that could be difficult it was grueling but uh I just stayed home, wore my back brace, did what I had to do. I never really had to go to rehab or physical, uh, yeah, physical therapy. And uh, just uh, had to sit around home, do nothing, heal up, and uh, now I'm back. Any issues today with your back uh, during the race? Did you have any problems, or is it pretty much out of sight, out of mind? Um, I had a little, it was hurting me a little, but kind of zoned out, did what I had to do, and uh won the race you did win the race and you had to hold off harrison burton there at the end um that was a great race you did such a great job holding him off um talk about those last few laps for me were your emotions going crazy or at that point are you just driving i mean i was driving wasn't looking in my mirror and it really paid off i knew he was right there i heard his engine um i was nervous but i knew uh, god had a plan for me and i knew it was in victory lane uh in the beginning of the race, um, you raced pretty hard with Ty Majeski. You guys kind of traded blows early. Talk about that. Was that just all in good racing, or was maybe there was a little something going on there? Uh, I mean, I timed it wrong the first time, and I got him sideways. Um, and then I got by him. He let me by, and he repaid the favor. But, you know, that's just racing. Were you worried at all that they were going to be a late race caution? Maybe somebody would stop on the racetrack uh, or at that point, it's just you're you're getting all you can get at the end. Uh, I mean, I had such a great car. I really wasn't worried if we got a caution, but if we did, I wouldn't be worried. I would have I would have just uh, drove my race. I mean, it's very impressive that you won the Rattler 250. It's even more impressive that you won it coming off a back injury. You haven't been in a race car for eight months, and it's even more impressive after that that it's your first race in a super late model. Uh, what does this do for your 2019 season uh, moving forward? It's just a big confidence booster, but uh, we'll just go back to the next race, uh, humble as can be, and uh, just put the hard work in like we always do and maybe get in victory lane another time. How does a kid from Long Island end up coming down here down south and whipping up on these boys? Uh, I mean, talk about the road you've had uh, to get to where you are now. I mean, I started when I was uh, in go-karts when I was four years old. I did go-karts about for uh, eight years and uh, got into Legends Cars, and I won the Bojangles Summer Shootout Championship. And after that, I got into a late model, and I knew that 
the full body was where I needed to be, and I really picked up on it quick. I'm going to pull a Bob Dillner question here. I'm going to say, I'm going to ask the serious question. What did you think about that rattlesnake? It was crazy. I mean, my adrenaline was going, but now that I look back at it, it was a little scary. Were you scared it was going to grab you, or uh, somebody asked you to kiss it? Yeah, I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, would you be scared to meet it again, or you know the next time you're going to meet it will be in victory lane? I'd definitely meet it again. That's right. Um, what are your plans looking like for this season? What are you guys going to be running? Where are you going to be racing? Uh, we're going to do uh, all the Southern Super Series and uh, some other races. I think about 15 to 20 more races. What are your expectations now? I mean, uh, coming into this weekend, I'm sure your expe expectations were to run well, but now to get the victory, what are your expectations for this season? Uh, just have really solid finishes, uh, keep the car in one piece, um, get top threes, top fives every weekend. That's the main goal. Just have to go into the next race, um, put in the hard work, and it'll pay off again. That's Giovanni Bramani, a superstar for sure, Bob, and uh, we're definitely going to be keeping our eye on this kid as the year goes on. The spotlight is certainly on Giovanni Bramani now after that big win at the Rattler at South Alabama Speedway yesterday. You can see his one-on-one -on -one interview from yesterday's race on the Speed 51 network for premium subscribers only just $9.99 a month, $79.99 a year. And I know, uh, Brandon, you're, you've been a big fan. You were one of those that, that said, you need to show more video. I want to see more video on your site. And you were the one of the ones that kind of prompted us to do this several years ago. Yeah, I think so. I think it's a big deal. I mean, if you go on, you know, if, especially if you weren't able to be there like myself, then you can go on. And um, I think Casey did a couple of videos from the track this weekend and I got to watch them and, you know, hear the scoops about the Hamner deal from Ricky and everybody else. And it's really cool to be able to keep up with it. You guys do a great job. The highlights for that race will be on the Speed 51 video network at 5 p.m. today. So highlights of that entire 250-lap race will be on at 5 p.m. Check that out if you're a premium subscriber. Now, you know, I, I still get back to, you know, the, the, the draft, you know, and I want to throw this at you because you said that Giovanni Bramani might be a sleeper number one pick. You were one of the, you know, several people. I think last year we had 76 people uh, on our panel of experts that actually voted uh, for their, you know, whatever they wanted to turn in anywhere from, you know, 10 to 51 drivers in terms of the youth in America and where they wanted to rank them 25 years or younger. And you couldn't have, you know, you could still have your rookie eligibility in NASCAR. Um, but do you think that, He's going to be higher than Chandler Smith. He's going to be higher than, than a Haley Deegan and some of those other drivers out there. Do you really think after one super late model race, be it a victory on a big stage, that he is a number one contender if you throw a couple of those names out there like that? I Like I said earlier, I used the word sleeper, and I 100% agree with that. No disrespect to Chandler Smith. Obviously, the kid's done a lot, but he's been around a little while, too. And, you know, at some point, win percentage has to factor in as well. He's just 16, though. He, th that's the funny thing about Chandler Smith. Uh, Chandler Smith, he's been around since he's 12 years old. We've known him for that long. And he's just 16 years old. He, he's just won, you know, a couple of ARCA events, just won a couple of super late model events. He has been there. But, but he, to me, you know, Mark Hewler and I were talking about, is there a clear-cut favorite? And if you look at the last couple of years, three years ago, you knew it was going to be a battle between Ty Majeski as well as Todd Gilliland. Okay? Ty Majeski got it. He's not now eligible in the next year Okay, in terms of you know, no matter whether he's in NASCAR or not, you're not eligible as the prior year's number one pick. So the following year was Todd Gilliland. Okay? Now he's out. He's going big time. Okay, so last year, everybody on the earth, I think it was the biggest landslide victory in terms of the number one draft pick in the history of the short track draft, which dates back I think like almost 15 years or something like that. Um, Harrison Burton was the number one pick. This year, I don't think there is a clear-cut favorite in terms of a number one pick. Well, and I think you're right, and I think the reason for that is because nobody has put themselves on a pedestal by winning crown jewel races like Ty Majeski did back in the day. 
introduce Geo. Yeah, he absolutely. did it yesterday. He did. Step one, right? I mean, that's how I feel about it. I mean, I no disrespect to Chandler Smith. The kid's great. He does a great job. Um, he hasn't had the success in the supers that I would like to see to be a number one pick. I'm I'm going to go ahead and stick with my sleeper. No, that that's what we got to get out of you. You know, I want to know why if you weren't going to pick a person, or if you are going to pick a person, you know what those reasons are. You know, and, and listen, you know we're all about pavement. We're all about dirt here. Uh, 100% short track racing. It doesn't matter what realm it is. You can see it here on Speed 51. And by the way, we have, uh, I think it's 127 live races at this time. And that number continues to grow throughout the rest of the year. Uh, we haven't even delved into our Summer Thunder series at all. I think there's like 60 some odd races already for premium network members only, and then many others are going to be pay-per-view in fashion. So live racing, you'll see that galore on the Speed 51 network. Uh, one person who is going to be part of our broadcast team from time to time this year is on the PFC Performance Hotline. Wesley Outland is with us, and welcome to the show, Wesley. Good morning. Glad to be on the bull ring. Oh, How happy. Doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Wesley just texted me. He says, man, if Casey bails on you, you know, if he's still sleeping, you know, just give me a ring because you had a busy weekend. You went from the North Carolina Modified Nationals at Fayetteville Motor Speedway up there outside of Raleigh to Caraway Speedway near Asheboro, North Carolina, from the dirt to the pavement. You're like us, 100% short track racing. Uh, let's start with Fayetteville first. Uh, how was that show and has it grown from when we saw it began at friendship years ago oh it's phenomenal um you know the first dirt broadcast actually that speed 51 network ever did was the north carolina modified nationals at, at elkin north carolina david streamy won that event well then there was a little you know growing pains and changes in the things and whatnot and they decided to part ways and change owners well, the owners that took over it just could not keep that momentum that Cody Watson with Edge Entertainment Company had. And then, of course, the opportunity came at the end of fall last year for Cody to get it back. And in doing so, he quickly started going back to work. And he got in touch with Brian Carter and Sam Driggers with Dirt Car Racing and the World Racing Group and got them to sanction the program. And they put together a monster schedule, and we brought it back to life this past weekend at Fayetteville Motor Speedway um, for the 10,000 to win modified nationals. Nick Hoffman, who has been cutting his teeth in late model racing lately, Bob, winning at Ocala for one of the Durant Lane events, is now a, a $10,000 champion of the North Carolina Modified Nationals, and he joins the list of Kyle Strickler and David Stremme, and what an awesome weekend of racing we had at uh, Fayetteville. It was a packed house. You know, Fayetteville, North Carolina, Bob, is in the southeast for that matter. It's prominently late model country, whether it's super late models, pro late models, limited late models. A special event like this, was a home run for Jim Long Jr., his wife Dina, and everybody at Fayetteville Motor Speedway. And it's just amazing what the show was on Saturday. By the way, are you a basketball fan at all? Who, who's your dog oh, in the fight? I love basketball. Who's your well, dog in the fight? Between Carolina and Duke on, uh, on, on Friday night. Let's not talk Rider. about that. I was literally at the Chinese restaurant where my mom and dad celebrated their 37th wedding anniversary. I literally, we got rained out Friday night, so I actually made the trip to spend time with my parents because I don't get to see them that much. You know what it's like, Bob, being away from Angie and the kids and on the road? Oh, yeah. So uh, you still got to have your mom and dad in your life, even though you're 35. That's right. Absolutely. So, was, so who you to hang out with them, and I, and I was literally biting my nails watching the game and just, uh, I would have liked to have seen Carolina beat Duke, but Duke earned that win. Yeah, they did, but uh, you know what? The NCAA tournament's coming up right now, but, uh, you know, and that's something. Uh, March Madness, how, how maddening was that event at Fayetteville? Uh, you know, a lot of cars. I texted back and forth with David Stremme a little bit this weekend after seeing a lethal hoodie in the pits where I was at at Brownstown Speedway. So, you know, uh, was the car count good, and do you think that event will continue? Uh, I believe so. You know, Jim Long has already uh, said to me via a video interviews for Renegades of Dirt and Dirt Car Racing that there will be the Renegades of Dirt back in 2020. Uh, there's a possibility that it will be the fourth annual North Carolina Modified Nationals or it will be an even bigger event. Or 
it will be the same with a lot more money on the line. Um, we had 42 of the best. We had 42 drivers from 10 states represented from Florida all the way up to New York. And of course, uh, you know, not only did they have the big money race for 10,000 to win, of course, Nick Hoffman won that event, the young buck out of Wake Forest, North Carolina, Christian Thomas, Bob, this is somebody that I watched build his resume from racing go-karts and then running late models at County Line in, in Dublin and Fayetteville. And he did he gets into a modified like not even a, a month ago and, and puts it in the it, he, he felt like it was a win. He got a second place finish. He held off the likes of Kyle Strickler, Taylor Cook, uh, Michael Altabelli, the names of the names, just a popular win for him being just finishing second. It was like a win. And then, of course, in addition to the big race, they had a non-qualifiers race. And the man out of Salzburg, Pennsylvania, the Express of Jonathan Taylor, won that event. And you would have, he, he was praising Fayetteville. Like, normally we run races, and if you don't make 24 cars, we pack up and we get nothing. Really a great show. And the fans responded. A great, great reception by the, the, the Fayetteville faithful in Boone City. The Modifieds will definitely be back in 2020. We are all about hashtag more short tracks here at Speed 51. That's all we talk about. And we're going to give away one of our Arizona sports shirts designed um, beautiful apparel that we started at the end of last year. If you share today's morning bullring Facebook post, we will be giving away. You'll be entered to win a new more short tracks t-shirt. Uh, certainly, it's got a dirt mod, a dirt late model, pavement mod, and a pavement super late model on the back of it with the hashtag more short tracks on the front. You got to check that out. I went a little old school today with the uh, the Got Speed shirt, one of my favorite shirts that we have ever done, just simply with the logo on the back because everybody wants to have more speed. It's the name of the game. That's why Ernest Performance services so many super late models around the country because Ernest Performance gives people more speed you like that plug you didn't even have to pay lot. for it. that was pretty good yeah you like that, that was pretty good that's right he's gonna have got speed shirts pretty soon you watch that but uh, let's switch gears talking about uh, dirt and pavement you were at caraway speedway uh, the other day wesley uh, yesterday as a matter of fact yes. and the the southern modified racing series actually kicked off its season the new pra tours that they call it uh, how was that show how many cars showed up and, and i know big money looked really good but what was the story of the day there you know, obviously, you guys, you and you and Brandon are talking about the situation with the motors in the super late model world for late models. The late model chassis bodies, uh, the new making models, the five star bodies has been the talk for the late models. Well, for the modifieds, it's been the tires, and that was one of the things that me and it, me and videographer Tom Ryan were really getting you know, little hints about, little conversations, not really trying to eavesdrop, but trying to get that B-roll footage, that behind-the-scenes content, and you could hear the conversations with the Myers brothers, with, with uh, you know, the other drivers like John Smith or, or the, you know, the Rocket Tim Brown, talking about the situations with the tires. And there's basically been a new tire that's been implemented, and they're making the series use it and these drivers are not used to these tires. And then, of course, in addition to that, there was an incident where a late race caution failed, which basically Jason Meyer showed his displeasure. John Smith showed his displeasure. The only guy that really wasn't complaining was Matt Hirschman, big money, who got the win, $5,000 payday. But but basically, the talks of the tires, Bob Dillner, is, you know, we, we, we really don't know what this tire is going to do. It's a harder tire than what it normally has been before. And, and most of all, this rule of you can't scuff and turn your tires to clean them off before coming to one to go. Because basically, when they come to the choose rule, they go to the cone, they come back around, they're taking the green. And a lot of drivers were not happy with that. And, of course, Jason Myers. And you'll be able to check out that interview on our coverage, of course, being a subscriber at Speed 51 Video Network. Basically, they all said, we're all in this same boat, but I think it's something that Renee Hackett, Randy Myers, and hey, guess what? Even former NASCAR Cup Series race director David Hoops are involved with the PRA program, the PRA Tours program. 
Yeah, that that's interesting. Uh, and I, Brandon and I are looking at each other, you know, just to clarify this rule again, Wesley. So you cannot scrub your tires after one to go or, or clarify that rule for us because Brandon and I are kind of looking at each other and just scratching our heads. Okay, so basically what they were doing was basically they put the cone out at the one-to-go indication. So basically they were making sure that scoring was correct before they put the commitment cone out. When they put the cone out for drivers to choose inside or outside for the restarts, okay, they cut the lights off and they were coming to one-to-go. So basically once they made that commitment for the cone, and they hit the back straight away. The cone lady runs across the track, picks up the cone, goes back across the track with it, and they're coming to green. Well, in doing so, they didn't have the chance to be able to swerve the cars back and forth, try to clean their tires off like they normally get a chance to do because they're coming to green. They're in the box ready to go. Okay, so it's not necessarily a rule. It's just something that happened because of the whole cone situation and so forth, just to clarify. It, it, well, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's per se a rule, but I think it's when they come to the cone, they're coming to green next time by. Gotcha, gotcha, 10-4. So maybe they need an extra lap. Maybe that's what they were trying to say. They I need gotcha. an extra lap to be able to clean their tires off because pretty much the, 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 the upset party of the whole deal was pretty much Jason Myers and his big brother, Bert. You know, he even said, he said, I feel bad for my brother because he was the sitting duck of this whole deal. Um, because, you know, if, if they wouldn't, they, that late race caution wouldn't have failed, I believe Jason and Burke could have really ran down Matt Hirschman and got around them. But, of course, on that late race caution, he got stuck on that restart, got stuck to the outside, didn't have a chance to clean off the tires for the restart, and then he just went up into the, into the tater patch, as we call it, the dirt road, dirt wall, into the marbles to the top of the racetrack uh, in the asphalt world, and it took his chance away from losing the race, and he ended up finishing fifth. Oh, gosh, you know, I don't know, Brandon. You know, I, I listen to that, and it's not a rule, okay? But, you know, Wesley's basically saying that the drivers were saying that they couldn't clean off their tires uh, after that cone was put on the racetrack. I, I don't know if I buy that too much because if you're if you're a good enough race car driver, you can still figure out how to get some heat and juice that, you know, gas, that throttle pedal a little bit, maybe clean those tires. It's a little bit more difficult when you're side-by-side, side, but it still can be done. Well, I mean, Matt Hirschman didn't have a problem. I mean, Matt Hirschman's, you know, and in all due respect, I mean, he's one of the one of the best ever, and you know, I'm pretty blessed in my own mind to be able to see him w- watch him race in his prime. It's a pretty cool deal, you know, and he's not a customer either. So, um, but yeah, he didn't have a problem. Yeah, John I mean, Smith didn't have the problem, it, right? It's the same for everyone. I, I I do find that there's a lot of wine in the racing, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> really? I mean, is you it really? To, you I had no to idea. Show him, Mark. I had no idea. Show his eye roll there when I said that you're on my camera. That was like classic right there. Oh, it's man. It just wears me out. Yeah, it just wears me out. Yeah. Well, Wesley, number one, we thank you for coming on the show. Uh, so thank you for that insight, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again. Absolutely, Bob. And I forgot to tell you about the PRA tours. We got so caught up about the tires and the restarts of the cone. Basically, what Renee Hackett and Randy Myers have done, they have took the Southern Modified Racing Series, what used to be the uh, 602 Super Limiteds, the 602 Super Mods deal, and, of course, now they got a Junior Young Guns Limited Late Model Series and a brand-new PRA Super Late Model Tour that will launch in a couple of weeks on April 13th at Orange County Speedway, and they have created an alliance, and that is the... uh, Pretoria Racing Alliance, and it's based off of the real estate company that Renee Hackett operates, Pretoria Real Estate, and Pretoria Real Estate uh, Reliance Tours is basically the new entity for all of these new sanctioning bodies, and they're right back on the road again this weekend at a track just down the road for me at Southern National Speedway, the high banks in Kenley, North Carolina, and of course, PRATours.com, you can find out information on all of them. Absolutely, and uh, we're covering a lot of that. We've had all those stories on Speed 51, uh, made the announcement here for PRA uh, in terms of what Renee and Darren Hackett are doing with those tours. Um, so, and In fact, we're going to cover a couple of those races live on Speed 51 this year. I want to get back to modified racing, Brennan, and, and I understand you even did a little modified testing here over the past couple of weeks. I think I saw something on Twitter that you were testing. Yeah, we went and um, tested at uh, South Boston uh, a couple days before Myrtle Beach. Doug Kobe, Phil Moran, and those guys on the two car, um, they, you know, 
have had a lot of success in the past and just kind of got to a point where they were wanting to do something different. And, you know, I got the call and got the opportunity. Very thankful for that. So do you, uh, are you part of the mod squad now? Oh, absolutely. Abs- I'm from Arkansas of all places, <laughs> but modifieds are, are possibly my first love in, in asphalt racing. Obviously, super late models are, are the larger quantity, and that's where I spend most of my time. And they're definitely 1A on my love list. The modifieds are definitely first, I think. So, so a kid from Arkansas, how did he get firmly planted on the pavement? Because basically around there, it's all dirt, baby. It is all dirt. I think there's one asphalt road course for (laughs) go-karts, and it's a small one. And I remember whenever I was a kid, there was this one go-kart track that was asphalt that had been shut down prior to me knowing what a go-kart was, for that matter. And um, I remember, you know, stopping and seeing it on the side of the road, you know, a few times and this and that. But other than that, I um, I was dirt grew up dirt racing. Obviously, moved here looking for more opportunity. I guess you'd say in 2005, and I ended up getting a job on a truck team. And my first asphalt race ever was a truck race at Atlanta Motor Speedway. Oh wow! Have you been to the Topless 100? I have been to the Topless Me 100 too. many times. And just a reminder for my buddy Kevin Kevin Rumley, we still have that bet. <laughs> What's the bet? It has something to do with winning the topless 100. We'll put it that way. Okay. I, I can tell you a funny story about me going to uh, Batesville Motor Speedway for the first time, and that was back in, like, I think 2016. Um, I had watched that event, seen highlights and pictures, and I just thought it was the coolest thing. Topless 100 means you take the top off of a dirt late model. Um but when I get there, I take a picture of the Batesville Motor Speedway sign, and I say, I finally made it to the hashtag topless100. That was not a good hashtag to use. <laughs> <laughs> because the comments and then the people that, that just got in that conversation, it was like very interesting. Let's just say that. You probably got connected with uh, quite a few different people on uh, on Twitter there than people that you weren't expecting. Just yes. The hashtag alone. Yes. It was it was interesting, to say the least, for sure. Uh, but uh, don't make that mistake. If you go to Batesville Motor Speedway, of course you want to go there because uh, that track is interesting. It is hot as heck there, but at the same time provides for some great racing, and you get to really see a great perspective with the drivers with the tops off inside the cockpits of those race cars. Uh, one other thing that we want to hit on this morning, uh, Kyle Busch, a big victory for him yesterday, uh, NASCAR career win 200. Uh, if you factor that into you know how many other races he's won, I don't know how many he's won at the bullring there as he was growing up with the dwarf cars, the legends cars, and then late models and so forth. But I have Kyle Busch overall at more than 225 victories with his 200 in NASCAR and at least 25 more uh, within the short track realm. But then I'm sure there's a ton that I don't know about. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of talk about that. What do you think about what the 200 means in terms of the sport that we love so much and what he's been able to accomplish? Well, I think the first thing is people just need to stop being so negative about it. Um, Bingo. Kyle Busch is a phenomenal talent. And to win 200 races in today's day in anything is phenomenal. To do it, you know, yes, he's only won, I think, 53 cup wins. And that's what everybody keeps saying. First of all, only, (laughs) only 53 cup wins. How many did Dale Jr. have? I'm not sure, but I think it, it was 18. Wasn't I, I think maybe it was a little bit more, but but um, still, I mean, here's the deal. I don't I don't think you know Dale Jr. Whatever it is, 18, 21, 23. You know, he he was a good cup cup absolutely, driver. Absolutely, okay, absolutely. But people wouldn't criticize him and say well, he not. only had that many. Hundred percent agree. And Kyle's got 53. Matt Kenseth's a prime example. Matt Kenseth had a stellar career, and like he doesn't get criticized the way Kyle does. Kyle is also the all-time win, all-time wins leader in Xfinity and Truck, I believe. And I just don't understand how people, if you like his personality or not, is beside the point. You have to respect the talent level. You have to respect it. And I just don't feel like people give him the credit he deserves. Uh, I, I agree with you 100%. Kyle Busch is 100% the most versatile racer in history in NASCAR alone. In those three divisions, he is simply the most versatile racer that NASCAR has ever seen. Now, at the same time, this brings up a little conversation, you know, because we talk about the greatest of all time. Well, the greatest of all time in racing, you know, at least in America, goes outside just that NASCAR perspective. 
And a lot of people forget that. Now, we talk about 225-plus wins uh, for Kyle Busch, you know, and that's an incredible feat, especially at what he has done at the highest levels of racing. But you compare that to what some other people have done, Dick Trickle, more than 1,000 victories, 912 wins for Brett the Jet Hearn, 837 for Billy Moyer. Steve Kinzer has 691 World of Outlaw Series wins. The list goes on and on. Scott Bloomquist with 601. I called his 600th victory. Uh, Ronnie Sanders, and this is interesting. Ronnie Sanders, according to Elgin Statboy Trailer, 535 victories. Richie Evans, I don't believe, the nine-time national modified uh, champion, doesn't even have that many victories according to what we have been able to find. He's right about that 500 mark. Joe Shear, senior, more than, uh, I think it was 600 wins is what we were able to gather up when we were looking at this last night. Kyle Busch, like I said, 225 plus, you know, maybe pushing 250. So that just gives you some perspective, obviously at the highest levels that everybody wants to get to. But at the same time, there's some big winners that we've seen throughout time in short track racing. No, that's true. And I mean, I guess when you're talking about the greatest ever, what what is the, the standard, right? I mean, I think at the end of the day, I, I know it goes outside of cup racing, but cup racing is the premier level in the country. And, man, everybody's comparing 200 to 200. Heck, I'd put Jimmy Johnson above Richard Petty. If you look at stats and, and what he's accomplished in a short amount of time, multiple different points, structures, I think four different types of cars now. You know, the old car, the year that we split the old car and the COT car, then the COT car, and then, the, you know, the current car. It's, and the guy's won in everything along the way. And, you know, I, there's a lot of diversity in that at – all at the highest level. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you can. It's a great debate. Great debate. Who's the best of all time? But at the same time, I don't think you can, you know, merge the eras in racing. You know, Richard Petty, with what he was able to do, with what Petty Enterprises was able to do in really advancing the sport to a new level. Winning 27 races in a single season at one point when they ran oodles of races, that will never be broken. Uh, so Richard Petty is the best ever. Dale Earnhardt, his seven championships, all those wins, uh, 73, 74, whatever it was, and all those Xfinity Bush Series, whatever you want to call it, wins. During his era, he is the best ever. Jeff Gordon for a time, the best ever. Jimmy Johnson after that with the seven championships, all his victories, the best ever. So I think if you look at different terms, I think it has to do with the time that you're in. And then even to some degree within the realms of short track racing, you know, who is the best ever? Okay. Was it Sammy Swindell? Was it Steve Kinzer? Kinzer's got a lot more wins in the world of outlaw circuit, certainly than, than Sammy uh, did. But at the same time, they went toe to toe forever. You know, you look at dirt late models. You know, and I saw this yesterday when, when I talked about it. Jacob Seelman actually tweeted out something about Steve Kinzer versus Kyle Busch. And I said, what about Billy Moyer? Billy Moyer's got 837. Well, then somebody came back and said, well, Scott Bloomquist is better. He's the GOAT. Okay, Scott Bloomquist has 601. You know, and both of them have won the crown jewel races. But at the same time, maybe Billy has won, you know, been a little bit longer career, has maybe won some more regionalized races, you know, than, than Scott has to bump up that number. There are arguments that you can go on for time, you know, for till the end of time to discuss even who was best in the different realms of racing. Yeah, I think you're right. And um, I, 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 I don't think there is a clear cut answer. I mean, I think the era thing is, is very important. One thing that I, that I do think is of note, um, on the dirt side, especially with the sprint cars and, and the dirt late models, is, like you said, Sammy Swindell and Steve Kinzer put those numbers down racing each other four nights a week. Billy Moyer and Scott Bloomquist have raced each other 70% of their career probably and, and still put those numbers down against, you know, the other argument for the best ever in, the, in their era. Now, I will say Billy Moyer has a lot of $1,500 win wins around Arkansas that are making that number right. up that Scott Bloomquist doesn't have. Exactly. That if was you, what I was talking about. If, if you count 
uh, championships and crown jewels, I think that number is probably. I, I don't want to quote that, but probably Scott is a little bit ahead. Squat, Scott, yes, I, I think so too. Yeah, so uh, you know, I spent a lot of time in the dirt. Actually, this past weekend uh, was with the Lucas Oil Late Model Dirt Series. The boys and I. I even brought Mark Keeler. You know, along with us, uh, Daryl Canfield, Patrick Cahey, we were all uh, Friday night at Atomic Speedway, and 20% chance of rain, then out of nowhere, here comes the rain, rained us out uh, right in the middle of qualifying, cool track there near Chillicothe, Ohio, I mean, just bad to the bone, and that was for you, Brandon Paul, racetrack. Uh, it was going to be a great show. Uh, that race has been rescheduled, as Madison said, uh, for April 11th. And then on Saturday night, we went to Brownstown Speedway. You talk about a cool little racetrack, Mark. That was a cool fairgrounds racetrack. And that's it was cool because it, it was a fairgrounds track, but it wasn't a huge fairgrounds. It was very quaint, very small, but uh, I loved it. Uh, the way they had the midway set up, which uh, you've said it many times, it's one thing dirt has on asphalt. Uh, all day long is their midway areas with the t-shirts and finally i had to lock my wallet in the truck because i was spending too much money <laughs> but um but yeah no really cool track uh the fans there i had more people come up and talk to me uh, you know at a racetrack that they had no clue who i was but very friendly people uh, out in the middle of nowhere but uh really cool track and and it seemed to hold up pretty good uh, during that late model race it was a, a really they could race pretty much all over that racetrack so it was a really good show there I tell you what, it was interesting because I, I got to hang out a little bit with my good buddy, James Essex. He's the voice of the Lucas Oil Late Model Dirt Series. And at one point I was in the booth and he kind of just brought me over and started interviewing me. And he said, uh, Who, who's going to win here tonight? And I thought about where we were and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go with the track favorite or one of them for sure. And I said, I think it's going to be the new deal, Hudson O'Neill. And the crowd, we were up in this little booth on top of this covered grandstand and the crowd erupted. That, folks, is what we are missing from pavement racing. That is what we're missing. That passion. You have it, but you got to show it a little bit more. People get to be just a little bit vanilla in pavement racing, and that's got to be fixed. Tell you what, we're going to come back here on the morning bull ring. We'll have what went on this past weekend in the news with Madison Mabry. And then on the other side of the break, Speaking of 100% short track racing, we'll have a guy that goes both ways, pavement and dirt in the open wheel ranks. Cody Swanson joining us next on the Morning Bull Ring. on-demand videos speed 51 network short track racers home for the best video coverage hey race fans download the new speed51.com app today breaking news feature stories the unfiltered podcast live race coverage schedules and more right at your fingertips download it today on itunes and the google play store Eight oh four in the morning. It's the morning bull ring on Speed Fifty One. I'm Bob Dillner, Brandon Ernest, alongside of me. What do you think? One hour into the show, we woke you up early to get here to Studio Fifty One. How's your evaluation? What grade would you give yourself right now? It's still early. You got to keep your microphone on more. Yet. 
Well, sometimes I sometimes I say things I shouldn't, so I'm trying to <laughs> protect myself and all the listeners out there. He's a clicker. He's, if we gave him a pen, he'd be like back and forth, just clicking, just driving you nuts, Mark Keeler, throughout the show. But uh, I think you're doing a good job. But I know how opinionated you are, too. I think we got to get a little bit more out of that in the second part of the show. Well, you I'm only bring opinionated it? sometimes. So, well, no, you're opinionated all the time. <laughs> well, I only say them out loud sometimes. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Usually on a conversation as we're driving down the highway. But uh, got a lot to talk about. Cody Swanson coming up just shortly. But right now, we're going to bring in the one, the only, Madison Mabry with the news in Short Track Racing. Back another time for the morning bull ring. There were a lot of first-time winners this weekend, actually, over on the West Coast on Friday night. Um, Carson Macedo picked up their first win with the Kyle Larson racing team with the World of Outlaws. They traveled over to Chico on Chico. Sato. Yes, That Chico. place is awesome. Silver it Dollar is. Raceway. I, I tell you what, see, that's where you don't have your, your microphone on and you, we couldn't hear what you had to say. See, rookie. We're going to put a yellow stripe on the back of Brandon Ernest. But that place is cool. I used to run it on the old World of Outlaws game. Do you remember that game? Did, did you play that game? Yes, I Leave did. Leave your microphone yes, on, would you? <laughs> Yes, is I that did. the 2002? Everybody has to play the 2002 World of Outlaw game. Were you born then? Yes, I okay. was actually. <laughs> <laughs> Barely, but I was there. <laughs> but yeah, Logan Shuhart picked up his first career win over there. It was actually a shark racing front row um, to start the feature. Him and his teammate Jacob Allen started on the front row, but Logan was holding off Shane Stewart to pick up the win. Brandon Shepard picked up his first B Shep. B Shep, that's right. Picked up his first Lucas Oil Late Model Dirt Series win at Brownstown, which you were at. So he had a pretty good run against Hudson O'Neill. He kicked butt, honestly. I mean, he checked out. Now listen, and even Mark Keeler, he's going to grab the other microphone now, and he's going to admit this. He loved it the other night. Not only the midway, but he's like, man, there is racing all over the racetrack. On the dirt for the Lucas Oil Late Model Dirt Series. Isn't that right, Mark Keeler? Oh, the microphone's not working. He's got to turn it on. <laughs> yeah, I got to turn the mic on. That's a dollar in the jar now. For there me. you go. You still owe like five, so. But no, it was, um, yeah, there's definitely racing all over the place. That's that's one thing that dirt has going on. You don't know where to look. The thing that kills me, and it gets me every time, and I've, t I've told you this a few times over the weekend, is they can be like two car lengths apart on the straightaway, and then they get into the corners, and one goes high and one goes low. And, and you don't know what's going to happen, if they're going to be able to pull off the slide with job and, and get up in front or whatever. So it, it makes it interesting. Every corner, there's no, there's definitely no rest for the weary in, in uh, dirt track racing. See, Madison, we're making him a dirt boy. He's going to be wearing the Dirt Life shirt pretty soon. He's got two Lucas Oil Late yeah, Model wearing, Dirt Series I got one hoodies. Right now. Yeah, so in, you're wearing yeah. one right now. Yeah. But I, I tell you what, Arizona Sports Shirts, they've done a great job with the apparel, the official apparel of the Lucas Oil Elite Model Dirt Series this year. Definitely. And talking about Mark kind of transferring over to the dirt world, you guys will be happy to hear this. I kind of enjoyed the modified racing this weekend. I was down at Myrtle Beach Speedway, and they had a heck of a show down there. Doug Kobe ended up winning after a roller coaster of a weekend. He had a flat tire, had to go to the rear at the start of the race. Um, because he ran over something, but he worked his way up through the field more than a couple times and ended up pulling off that win. But hold on. Hold on. I know Myrtle Beach Speedway. It's not comparable to places like yes. Thompson. And listen, but. Myrtle Beach Speedway is only good for like the last 20 laps of the race because everybody's got to conserve tires. Am I not right, Brandon? That is true. That is true. And I, th I think it was probably about 25 laps to go that um, Kobe decided to go. And he did set fast time, too, by the way. Um, <laughs> Just to add to that. Ernest Performance helping out with that team? Absolutely. Yeah, there you go. Absolutely. little plug, little plug Absolutely. right there. You got to get them in, right? But Myrtle Beach, that, that pavement is so just old, honestly. It just gobbles up tires. It is, and, and I hate to say it, but it's not the most entertaining no, race to watch. It's but, not. Man, those last 20 laps when you're seeing somebody coming from the back that's the, you know that's a really good racer, man, if they put on a show. They should just make it a 20-lap race. They should just run every race 20 laps. 20. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> That's I it, agree. For sure. South Boston will be much better here in a couple of weeks, Madison. Definitely. I'm looking forward to that one. Something that impressed me this weekend was Gio Bermonte down at South Alabama Speedway. 
in his Long Island gang. Of course, Bob has to throw that in. <laughs> but in his super late model debut with Anthony Campy, he pulls off one of the biggest wins he can possibly have in his career. And by the way, we're still trying to clarify. We got a comment on Twitter, and if you got any questions here, uh, certainly let us know. Uh, they are starting to come in. Um, and who was it actually earlier? Brandon actually texted me, and somebody said uh, Jeremy said it was a McGonagall engine underneath the hood of that Geo car for Anthony Campy Racing, not a progressive engine. So we have texted Anthony Campy, but as I check my phone right now, Anthony Campy is still not up. He's probably I, still I think Anthony's hungover. still in bed. I think he's still in bed. <laughs> um, and, that, and that was my fault. I'm the one that said it was a progressive to begin with. And I, I do actually, I'm 99% sure it is a McGonagall. I just would, you know, not want to be wrong twice in the same morning. <laughs> so I would kind of like strikes some confirmation you're out, baby. for that, right? But um, I do. I, I'm 99% sure. I do remember seeing on the on the Sweet 51 broadcast, um, Mr. Dwayne in Victory Lane. Okay. So I'm pretty confident that is correct. Congratulations to them guys too. By the way, they do a great job as well. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. But I would just like for Anthony to say yes. Yeah, Anthony, please text us back. Yeah, wake up, okay, son. Wake what up. are you doing? Jeez. And by the way, he's got about ten dollars in the jar here with his mute button up here. We're gonna take it, Can take we it bring away him from back him. next week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We got lunch money for sure. By the way, Madison, Connor Sullivan on Twitter just says Madison Mayberry needs to come up to Connecticut. That's where the best modified racing is. I'm definitely going to have to make a trip up there. I was thinking about this weekend. I was like, where could I go? But Thompson and Stafford might be on my list to make a new track trip to. Um, still in South Alabama, Casey Roderick pulled off his pro late model win for the Baby Rattler. But here's your feel-good story of the weekend. Bring it. Lancaster Motor Speedway, Michael Brown ended up winning three features over the weekend. He won the Crate Late Model feature on Friday. And then another one on Saturday, but picked up the Carolina Clash win at his home track. So it was emotional for him to be able to win that. And we'll see if he can continue that streak coming up at Cherokee this Sunday, March Mandis. If you can't make it to Gaffney, South Carolina, you can watch that race pay-per-view style on Speed 51. Right now, we could be tuning up for a triple header on the dirt in terms of live races on Speed 51 this weekend. We know for sure Saturday we will be at the Ultimate Northeast opener at Hagerstown, Maryland. That will be live for premium network members only. And then on Sunday, we will be at Cherokee Speedway for the Southern All-Star Series. The Dirt Late Models, big names, Chris Madden, um, you know, unfortunately, Scott Bloomquist, um, he's injured because of a bike wreck down in Daytona during bike week. He won't be there, uh, but Chris Ferguson and a bunch of other people I'm hearing are starting to think about coming to Cherokee, Brandon Overton, and more on Sunday. And we're also thinking about, we got to go down to Carolina Speedway, maybe do a little test this week, possibly the fuel race on Friday night, putting that live on the Speed 51 network. So uh, plenty of dirt late model racing going on this weekend here on the Speed 51 video network. Yeah. I like it. I'm not a fan of that Cherokee. I put that right there with Myrtle Beach, but oh, come yeah. man, how could you? Wait a second. You are completely flat out, 100 percent, unequivocally wrong. Okay. Well, I mean, you're entitled to your opinion too. <laughs> I, I love. Doesn't mean you're going to change my mind. I love the flat out nature of Cherokee. I mean, it it is just you know you put the throttle pedal to the mat and just hold it down, and that that's what I love about Cherokee. So it'll be a great show, March Madness this Sunday. Uh, we got some more comments coming in, by the way, too. Uh, good morning from Aruba, Kenneth Smith. How about that? Watching the morning bullring from Aruba. That's pretty impressive. We're actually international now at that <laughs> point in time. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm glad we have everybody tuning in here. Um, definitely, there were a lot of modifieds up at Fayetteville Motor Speedway for the Renegades of Dirt. Nick Hoffman ended up pulling up the win off and adds his name to the winners up there with Kyle Strickler and David Strimmy. Going back to talking about Cherokee and the Southern All-Stars, unfortunately that got rained out a couple weekends ago, um, so they didn't get to have their season opener there, but like you said, they'll be back on Sunday. But this past weekend, they were down in Southern Raceway in Florida. Neil Baguette won on Friday, and then Casey Roberts won on Saturday. Moving on over back into North Carolina, Big Money Matt Hirschman picked up the win at Caraway. I know we were talking um, to Wesley earlier about how that was a 
interesting race to have, but like we said, Matt Hirschman always finds a way to win somewhere. He does. Big money. You put money on the line, and Matt Hirschman is just going to gobble up the competition. I know he's not one of your customers, but, uh, man, uh, so much respect for he's so good. what he's able to do. He's so good. I watch him for so long. He's a student of the game, of course, he a is. son of five-time NASCAR Wheel of Modified Tour champion Tony Hirschman. And, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time throughout my life uh, with the Hirschman family, uh, being a modified guy, watching them as a fan, and then finally at 15 years old getting to become a quote-unquote journalist. I didn't know what the hell I was doing at that time. <laughs> but I uh, went in there and started interviewing some of my heroes, and it was neat because I just, you know, I basically wrote what, what – I thought, you know, which kind of got me in trouble. I got kicked out of Riverhead Raceway the first year I was a rider when I was 15 years old and lied about my age to get into the pits for, because of the NASCAR license. <laughs> nice, nice. I have been to Riverhead Raceway, actually. Oh, you have? And the I, head. I, I kind of like it. I like the place. It, it is great racing, bottom line. You know, you, you give me a quarter mile any day, and I'll take it over a, a, a big track, for sure. Uh, I mean, just the sound. And, and this is what was interesting. You know, for me, you know, I've been around for a while. I'm not an old dude, but I've been around for a while. been to 283 racetracks after Atomic and Brownstown now. So uh, it's a lot of racetracks. Uh, Mark is, is, is right about 100. 98. Now. 98. There you go. So two more, and, and he's going to break the century mark. But, you know, I went to Madison last year, and I think one thing for me, I was sitting in the grandstands during practice. And uh, there in the first turn, and I heard that sound, that sound of lifting off the throttle pedal, getting back on it, kind of burping it in the corner a little bit. And that sound right there just warmed my heart, electrified me for the day. And you hear that on quarter-mile racetracks all the time. So uh, that's, oh, that's just awesome. You do. I'm, I'm personally holding out hope that Monadnock gets brought back to the modified schedule. That's the one I'm waiting for. Um, wait, it's not on the modified schedule? No, they're not going there this oh, year. Oh, bummer. Mad Dog, that's uh, I love that place. I it grew up around beer those garden. tracks. I mean, how yep. can you not like that? Yeah. <laughs> it's a all those tracks up there have so much character because they're, yeah. they're they're older. They you they know do. They I, do. I just love the character of all those tracks well, in the Northeast. Well, you know, no matter where you go, I mean, you know, back in the day, you know, Plainville. I mean, uh, that that was an interesting racetrack. But then Riverside Park was so much fun. Uh, Stafford Motor Speedway on Friday nights. Uh, Thompson with their twilight shows there on yep. Sunday. You know, uh, you know, before they put the wall, you had the, the big, you know, sand there in, in uh, turn one and two. I mean, so much charisma for all those tracks. Islip and Riverhead and Wall Stadium and Shangri-La and Spencer and Lancaster and Holland and, you know, Oxford. And, you know, I got to see a lot of good modified racing. Claremont up there in New Hampshire uh, back in the day. It was so much fun because what we would do, and we're going to get to our next guest here in a second who loves racing himself, uh, but... What we used to do is my dad used to say, hey, let's go. We're going racing for the weekend. And my mom and dad and my brother Matthew um, would, would jump into the truck. And now my dad didn't have like a four-seater like you would have these days. So, you know, back in the day, he didn't even have a cap. So when we, when we went to the racetrack, my brother and I would sit in the bed of the truck. So when we were on the highway, he would stay, say, stay down. <laughs> okay, I don't want the cops to see. Stay down. But then we got the cap on the truck, and we had the little sliding glass window, so we'd be able to talk to mom and dad as we went up the highway to New England or wherever we were going, and that's how we went to the racetrack. And then, honestly, for multi-day shows, we would have sleeping bags, and four of us would sleep in the back of my dad's truck, my mom, my dad, my brother, and I. We're not little people, so <laughs> we had to squeeze in there, but... but that, that's that's just great memories, honestly, that, that I will never forget, and that's what kind of makes short track racing what it is. I agree completely. Um, I, I think, for whatever reason, a lot of those tracks up there are just very historic, and I don't know why necessarily. Maybe it's because it's normal to us down here, but we don't have the quantity of those. We have a lot of racetracks that you just don't think of in the same way, I guess you would say, and, and I, I, don't, I don't know why that is, but that, I just thought of that from what you said, but I remember doing the same thing whenever I was younger, going and sleeping in the truck. Heck, I still do that sometimes. And, uh, you know, just making it overnights and whatnot. And it's good times for sure. By the way, Joe Mancuso, who is a racer from I've New, never heard of him. New York. And, I don't know who that and, is. And he's saying Madison and Brandon both need to come up to New York State to experience a Race of Champions Asphalt Modified Series event. 
And I tell you what, uh, Joe Scott, Nikki, and Amy, uh, his wife, uh, they really carry on the tradition of the race of champions, which is just kind of near and dear to my heart. Uh, they do a great job. Nine races on the ROC Asphalt Modified Series schedule this year. Yeah, I do think they do a really good job. I've started following them a little bit more the last couple of years, um, you know, because of Joe and, and talking to him and working with Hosfeld and those guys on that team. Um, I think they do a good job, and, and I think they do a – I think they do a really good job of, of focusing on their area and their region and taking care of their racers, and I think that's pretty important. And by the way, we do have uh, a comment by Matt Kendall, and it will lead us into our guest on the PFC Performance Hotline. Cody Swanson is the best open-wheel racer, not in NASCAR or IndyCar, without question. So, Cody Swanson, do you agree with that assessment? I, I, I don't know. That's for, for me to judge, but I, I appreciate the kind words. That's for sure. Uh, it's always good to kick off uh, a, a first time caller on the morning bull ring with a great comment like that. Cody, you're getting ready to start the USAC Silver Crown season this weekend, this Saturday at Memphis Motorsports Park there in Tennessee. How pumped up are you for the season to begin? Yeah, I mean, definitely looking forward to it. Uh, it's been a, been a very busy winter trying to get the Nolan Racing team uh, ready my first time running silver crown with them and looking forward to uh my first trip to memphis and um, hopefully we can uh, have a good run there four-time usac silver crown series champion you won two in a row uh several years ago won two these past two years you know what do you think uh you know last time you did two in a row you couldn't get the third so is that going to change this time around uh yeah that's that's the idea you know we you go to give it your best shot and hope that um that you win it there in the end so um, I think this year, you know, be a new team for me, but uh, 12 races on the schedule. And, um, you know, if we, if we give it our best uh, run in every one, then um, I hope, hope we're there to, to take the title at the end. You know, 24 career USAC Silver Crown wins. Uh, you got a couple in the midgets. You got, uh, you know, one in the sprint cars as well. But, but why are you a guy that loves the Silver Crown series? Uh, I think I love the longer races, you know, and the, and the heavier cars that, um, you know, we run hundred miles at a time, but uh, no, no pit stops. So you got to make your tires count and strategize, you know, the, the entire duration of your race and, and be there at the end. So um, each one is different. I, I love the fact that we get to run dirt and pavement for the same series still. And, um, you know, you just never give up. So it's a, it's a great series and, and one that's uh, it's been my favorite. Cody, you know, what I like about the Silver Crown series is the fact that, you know, through time, you know, Silver Crown has run different surfaces. I haven't even peeked at the schedule this year. What, what does the series look like in terms of a championship run for you this year? Yeah, I mean, um, this year we got 12 on the schedule, six dirt and, and six pavement. And, um, you know, our dirt races, we have the, the three miles uh, here at Indianapolis, Springfield and DeCoin in Illinois. Uh, we go to some pretty famous half miles like Terre Haute, Eldora, and Williams Grove. Um, and, and then on the pavement, you know, we're making our, our first trip to Memphis in, in quite some time. I think 2004 was the last time the series was there. Uh, we'll run at Lucas Oil Raceway here in Indy uh, a pair of times. Uh, on the high banks at Salem, uh, up in Madison, Wisconsin, and um, in Toledo, Ohio. And so all, uh, all have been pretty good tracks to me, I, I think, uh, you know, except for the ones we haven't been to yet. Looking forward to them as well. So. Um, it, it's, a, it's a neat variety, and, and you got to kind of be on your game for all of them. You know, new team this uh, year that you mentioned. How did this new opportunity come about? Yeah, um, you know, I, I had such a, a great run and a very fortunate relationship with the De Palma family team. Uh, we won their fifth straight owner's title this year and set a USAC record with that, and um, they've been in the sport for a long time and decided that uh, the timing was right for, for them to get out on top. And, um yeah, I don't, I don't blame him at all. I sure, sure appreciate the time we spent together. And uh, I'd run for Gene Nolan a couple times, a little 500, and, and helped him win his first little 500 this past year. And so he was someone that kept in touch with me um, if, if an opening ever came in my Silver Crown schedule. And, and when it did, um, you know, we got in touch and, and looking forward to uh, trying to win him his first Silver Crown title this year. Let's talk about that little 500 because uh, we have been there. We have broadcasted uh, the little 500 in the past here on Speed 51. I was the infield camera, and I believe Mark Keeler was directing at that time. And not only was I there to capture some of the pit stops and so forth, but he wanted to use my camera, and I had to follow the action in the infield. Well, 
gosh, you know, little quarter mile oval. Uh, I was dizzy at about lap 25, just spinning around one of those cement blocks that you have in the infield. I could just imagine what that race is like from behind the wheel. I mean, how is that 500 laps around a quarter mile oval there just outside of Indianapolis? Yeah, I mean, it, um, you know, it's the most unique race we run each year. Yeah, but in, in that respect, it, it, it's kind of like a silver crown race or maybe like two or three of them all stuck together you know, with, uh, with the pit stops because every stint is long and, um, you, you transition so much, you know, from having good tires at the beginning of it to being, um, really wore out and used up at the end and, you know, all your competitions doing the same cycles. And, and, uh, so it's, it's really fun strategy wise. And it's a race that, um, that you're never really out of, but you got to catch some breaks if you want to be there at the end. And, um, what, what makes it so fun to drive is that you, you always race in somebody you know, they put 33 of us on a quarter mile and, uh, there's no space to yourself, you know, for 500 laps. So it uh, makes a lot of fun. You're always trying to work in traffic inside or out, and um, it's uh, it's one of my favorite races each year. Memphis Motorsports Park this weekend. Uh, what are your thoughts on heading to Tennessee and battling that racetrack this weekend? Yeah, um, you know, I've been to the facility one time and we got rained out, but um, I've done a lot of a lot of my homework and watched videos from when the Silver Crown was there. I know the Canaan Series has been there each of the last two years and trying to learn about the track, the shape, uh, the surface. Um, it seems like it, it uh, really chews on tires a little bit, which is uh, you know, always a factor for our series. So, um, you know, I, I've been really looking into it and looking forward to it. I think they're excited to uh, have a series down and I'm uh, looking forward to kicking off our season opener there. By the way, March Madness coming up. Uh, are you a basketball fan? Uh, you know, not, not, I mean, I am, I, I played in high school or I, I practiced and then would watch <laughs> the games because so, it wasn't that good. So are you so, pull, pulling for anybody or no? Shoot, sorry, I missed that. Are you pulling for anybody in March Madness during the NCAA uh, tournament? N- no, I, I would say I don't pay attention that much, but I, I definitely, uh, you know, enjoy the competition and how, you know, hearing the stories and everyone raise their game for, for the tournament makes it, uh, makes it a fun time to, to enjoy watching. See, Cody, Brandon Ernest alongside of me is very happy right now because uh, he doesn't pay attention to it either. Uh, you know, so y- I got two racers that don't pay, atti- pay attention to the, uh, the basketball March Madness, but Cody Swanson, we appreciate you coming on the morning bullring, and uh, certainly good luck this weekend at Memphis. Hey, thanks. Appreciate you guys having me on. No problem whatsoever. Cody, good guy. Uh, Hard-nosed racer, tough guy, um, but just really gets it done in those Silver Crown ranks. Uh, You know, I watched him over there before, and it just really seems to suit his style, you know, going from the pavement to the dirt and all different tracks and all different sizes. Yeah, I think so. It's actually a pretty pretty unique schedule there with, you know. I'm sorry. No, 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 you're Um, good. I was trying to tell Mark Killer oh, something perfect. over there. <laughs> um, no, going they, they they're literally they're literally going from Memphis Motorsports Park to Terre Haute, Indiana. I mean, how cool is that, right? <laughs> Three quarter mile asphalt to a very large half mile dirt. Yeah, that's that's, that's interesting. Pretty cool. And just to let you know what we just did there, basically he's talking first timer on the show, yellow stripe on the back, and, and basically when he was talking, I shut off my mic and just you know just very softly said break to cue Mark Keeler and Tom Ryan that we are going to break. But on the other side of that break, we're going to have an interesting conversation with the lead tech official for so many super late model series in America. Ricky Brooks coming up next on the Morning Bull Rig. Bullpog for the third time this week. Brandon Shepard, he wins all four World of Outlaws events. Scott Bloomquist! A big win in the Pro Late 100 tonight. Timmy McCready in the World 100. Chase Purdy wins! Speed 51's Video Network, where the battles are legendary. Get the full picture on short track racing. We'll take you behind the scenes. Um, he's just a meathead. He's always the same way. Your track, your driver, your sport, your passion. Dirt, late models, modifieds, and more. Race highlights, recaps, interviews, and thousands of on-demand videos. Speed 51 Network, short track racers home for the best video coverage.
Hey race fans, download the new speed51.com app today. Breaking news, feature stories, the unfiltered podcast, live race coverage, schedules, and more right at your fingertips. Download it today on iTunes and the Google Play Store. Tune in Mondays here on the Morning Bull Ring. New time, 7 a.m. Uh, we'll go to about 9.30. That's what we're thinking. Uh, we're trying to avoid that overtime. Brandon Ernest with me, Bob Dillner, this week here on the Morning Bull Ring. Uh, Casey LaJoy will return to the show next week. Uh, Tom Ryan, Mark Keeler along with us as well as Madison Mabry. It's a Monday morning. It's always tough waking up on a Monday morning coming in this early, but kudos to you, Brandon, for doing it. You're starting to get a little bit more lively. Yeah, that, that is tough. I'm not much of a morning person. <laughs> and we're getting a lot of questions and comments on our social media, so make sure you keep them coming. We're trying to get Ricky Brooks on the line right now, so Ricky or if somebody is next to him or whatever right now, uh, he told us he was coming on at about 8, 20, 30 this morning. We are calling you from a 386 area code. Answer your phone, buddy. A lot of people want to hear what you have to say. But going through some of the comments right now, um, Rob Christian asked, are we covering any ARCA Midwest Tour races this year? Yes, indeed. We plan to cover each and every one of them. The ARCA Midwest Tour, certainly one of the best late model series in America. They have interesting rule up there with the two-barrel carburetor and so forth. But uh, Greg McCarns has really tried to refine that series, refine that style of racing up there in the Midwest. Has done a good job. But I think now some racetracks are starting to go again against them a little bit and that's kind of bringing up another you know situation up there in the midwest so it'll be interesting to see how that pans out yeah i think so i think for a long time up there the you know the the weekly racetracks the rule book would literally say midwest tour rules and i think some of them are starting to get away from that which i'm not personally a fan of because it creates these almost hybrid divisions where it's not quite a super late model and it's not quite a limited late model and you know, it kind of locks some guys into only being able to run specific track, you know, with their current rules package. And I'm just not a fan of it myself. But what I am a fan of is the Milwaukee Mile. I'm excited about that yes, one. Yes, sir. Big time. You need a big race, a cornerstone race. And we know that Oktoberfest is a cornerstone for the Arkansas Joe West Shear. Tour. Uh, Joe yep. Shear Classic there at Madison. Uh, but bringing back Milwaukee – is really like bringing back Daytona to that area. I agree completely. So great job by Bob Sargent, Adam Mackey, uh, as well as McCarns, you know, for bringing back Milwaukee. That's going to be a blast to go there this year. Speed 51 will be there. And, and that series is just so strong. Um, those competitors there are diehards for the Arkham Midwest Tour, and they always have a good championship battle. But more importantly, those boys are racers up there. Holy cow, are they? Um, if you go there, I mean, it's 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 dualies and trailers. It's not, you know, and there's there's a few stackers, but it's not eighteen wheelers. You know, those guys are working on their own cars. They're doing everything themselves. There's not very many people up there that are paying, you know, crew chiefs and and hiring or buying rides and such. It's just it's it's almost a throwback to the way racing used to be. And that's probably a good thing in a lot of ways. I, I agree 100%. By the way, we got a question for you. Uh oh. This is interesting. Is this Joe Mancuso again? No. Okay. Brennan Willard wants to know Is that Bill Fry's old crew chief ugly face on the morning bull ring this morning? Well, the answer to that is no, because I don't think I would ever <laughs> be classified as a crew chief. But great shout out to my racing hero, Bill Fry some of the best times of my life in those days. So so what were those times like? Well, it was um it was a learning experiment <laughs> to say the least. I had no idea how much I didn't know until I started working at Bill Fry's shop and and you know learned that very quickly and you know got yelled at a couple times and you know all that sort of thing, but um learned how to do a lot of stuff there. I mean, I went from literally when I walked in the door not being able to weld at all and you know, by, you know, a year later, I'm building headers for the cars and, you know, welding on the chassis themselves and bumpers and such. And it's really where I found my love for shocks as well. Um, we kind of had some, you know, we raced a lot. So we kind of had some, uh, you know, we had to be able to take care of our shock problems whenever a problem presented itself. And, um, you know, kind of started that process there. And that was, uh, that must have been about 2000, I guess. And 
um, it, it was really a big deal for me, a big stepping stone. I still, still to this day, if I have a question about life or how to, you know, be a professional in some ways, that's that's probably one of the first guys I would call. That's pretty cool. And yeah. yelling is part of racing. It Whether is. you're on a race team or Speed 51, you know, our people yell at each other Absolutely. all the time. We've had that happen this morning. I saw, I think, Tom Ryan and Mark Keeler were going to go to blows there just a second ago. I had to yell, stop! <laughs> but uh, at least it shows passion, for sure, of all of our group to make sure that we put the best show forward. And that's what I have to say. By the way, we're going to have to get you to fill out a bracket. We're going to have the Speed 51 Bracket Challenge return Turning to Speed 51, we'll have those brackets out later on in terms of the league. So we're going to make you fill out a bracket for the NCAA tournament, Brennan. Is this the football thing? No, basketball. Orange and black ball. Anyway, Doug Kobe is on the PFC Performance Hotline, big winner of the NASCAR Willow Modified Tour opener at Myrtle Beach Speedway. But more importantly, Kobe... You're from New England. Okay, a lot of people are UConn fans up there. I don't even know if they made the tournament or not, honestly. But uh, are you a basketball guy? Are you going to pay attention to the NCAA tournament? Oh, man. Uh, First of all, thanks for having me on, Bob. Uh, Basketball, kind of like a little second passion of mine, college basketball. I've been a huge fan of the tournament since I was about eight years old. And I used to, uh, you know, before, before the days of the Internet, when the brackets came out in the newspaper the following morning i used to grab it and make my own chart and and follow everything the whole time when i was you know nine ten years old so it was uh always been something that got me excited and and selection sunday is one of my favorite favorite sports days of the year so who's gonna win who who's going to the final four how about that uh i don't know man you know it's just gotten so crazy in these last couple years i i watch all these you know experts on espn and cbs and of course they all have the number one and two seats meeting in the elite eight and you know (laughs) three number ones and one number two making the final four and i think the last seven years you've had a team seated seven or higher make the final four so um you know i i like i hate to say it because i'm the the biggest anti-Duke fan out there, but I just like how they're playing. Um, I I think there's a lot of weaknesses in some of the other teams out there. A lot of them lost in their conference tournaments, and and Duke certainly looks really good when they're healthy. But um, I'm going to pick against them just because as a UConn fan, that's the only right thing I can do. But uh, they do look real good. Kobe, despite what Justin Bonsignor says about you, man, I love you, dude. I love you. Any guy that roots against Duke, you know, is is near and dear to my heart. So thank you very well, much. Well, you know, I, I, and that's awesome because UConn has been struggling, as we all know. Uh, we just got a new coach, uh, Danny Hurley, and he's going to hopefully turn the program around. So we haven't made the tournament in the last few years. But, you know, we have won the most national championships of any school in the last uh, 15, or 15 years, I think, so or 20 years now. Um, so, you know, I'm an anti-Duke guy. You know, you have to be back from the days of Christian Leitner. If you can't hate Duke because of that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thing. I want one of those shirts. I hate Christian Leitner. <laughs> yes. It's, you know, that's what oh. started it for me. It's funny because it was right around, you know, the early 90s that I started to become really passionate about UConn basketball. And uh, when Christian Le- everybody talks about the shot that Christian Leitner hit against Kentucky as the, you know, the shot, but there was actually one before that and it was against UConn. So, um, you know, it's just, uh, one of those things where when you're a young kid and somebody knocks your team off, then you kind of develop that hatred. Christian Leitner is punk, still a punk to this day. A little passionate about that. <laughs> anyway, Agreed. See, see, you can add JJ Reddick to the list too, man. Yes. <laughs> yes. And Grayson <laughs> Allen. What a cry baby. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Those Duke players just tick me off. Bottom line. I think you're And then recently you can add Grayson Allen to the list too. So we'll just keep going if you want. We'll yes. just <laughs> no, no. find me the, the hated Duke player. I can name them all. <laughs> now Brandon Ernest is with us. Kobe, you oh you, you allow him to work on your race car despite the fact that he hates basketball? Well, I mean, this is a new partnership, so I didn't know that about him. <laughs> in, in fairness, we I don't hate basketball. That, I just know? don't know what it is. <laughs> Well, he's from. He told me he's from Arkansas originally. So I mean, I, I guess that doesn't surprise me that he doesn't know anything about basketball. You know? How do you react to that? I mean, I I have nothing. I mean, it's probably true. <laughs> it's probably true. You you want to talk about? Racing, I do know that you? Michael Jordan oh. played a basketball game in the Pine Bluff Convention Center in my hometown when he played for maybe it was North Carolina. I don't remember. Oh, there you go. I remember that was a did big thing in town. Did you go? I did not. Some basketball <laughs> history right there. He yeah. knows who Michael Jordan played for. He had the opportunity, Kobe, to go see Michael Jordan play in his hometown, and he didn't go. 
Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to know what his other options were. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was probably a kid and didn't even know. I didn't even know that was going on until years later. I would assume. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Brandon, he, he he lived in the sticks for sure for a while. But that is a true story. Now he's really coming to prominence because he's working with you a little bit on the whole NASCAR wheel and modified tour deal. I mean, that's pretty cool. You know, you get Kobe. You know, five-time champion, and you, you know, you won a ton, ton of races all over the map. That's kind of like a dream team, don't you think? Well, if you're yeah. asking me, I, I think so. <laughs> I mean, we've been uh, obviously competitors against uh, Brandon and JRI for, you know, several years. Obviously, you know, kind of started with Ryan Priest running his stuff. I think that was the first exposure I saw um, to, to Brandon's stuff. And then, you know, just what – what he's been able to do is just not only the modified short track deals, you know, all across the country with super late models. I just think it's, uh, it was the right direction for our team to go. Um, and we actually made that decision after new Smyrna. So, um, we, uh, decided to go with the JRI package that Brandon offers and, and we're obviously pretty happy so far. We tested really well at South Boston with it and then come across, you know, with a win at Myrtle beach. And now we move on. And a fast time. Oh yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it keeps getting left out. <laughs> That's the part I like. I like the what, fast times. What do you want to ask Kobe? Um, yeah, I, I, I asked him. I said, "Do you want? Do you want to? Yeah, your co-host, oh, Kobe. Yeah. Help me out here. You might need to come in and replace him at some point because I asked him. Do you want to ask Cody Swanson anything? And he just shook his head. No, no, no. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> you you got to ask Kobe something. So, what was is the most well, intelligent question that you can come up with right now at eight forty one in the morning? At eight forty one in the morning, why are we awake? <laughs> That's the first question. Because we're adults? Yeah, we're, we're up by 11 we minutes. We wake up at like 8.30 or 9. That's what adults do. It's 8.41. Yeah. Um, so I do have a question for you. Tell me a little bit about how um, how you guys came together as a group with you know with the car owner and yourself and Phil. How did that all come about? Oh, really? It just came uh, from two different directions. You know, I had been running with the 52, and we won the championship in 2012, and uh, finished runner up to Ryan priest in 2013. And, uh, it seemed like after that season, my car owner, you know, was probably going to go back to part-time racing again. Um, he had kind of made it apparent that, it, you know, to run for championships every year might not be financially feasible. So, um, so I kind of knew that we were looking for, uh, another team to pair up with or something was changing with the team. And it just seemed like it was starting to get a little bit unstable and, Back at that point in my career, uh, Bob knows I was a, before I settled in with a 52 for a couple of years, I was a journeyman and, you know, once drove for five teams and one over the course of one season just to get a bunch of races together. And I was looking for stability. And uh, coincidentally, at that time, the two team uh, was, was looking to make a driver change. Uh, they had Todd Zeggy for a long time and uh, they were looking to go in a different direction. So they had called and offered it to me. And um, it almost didn't happen because I took a long time to make my decision. It wasn't something that I made. Uh, I didn't take it very lightly to decide if I wanted to leave the team that I had just won a championship with and finished second. And we still were winning races and still, you know, I love those guys. They were, they were awesome to work with. Um, and I wasn't sure if the two team was the right fit for me, you know, even though they had amazing equipment and, and good guys, I just, you know, when you go to make change, you just never know if it's going to work out. And believe it or not, Phil, <laughs> Phil actually got to the point because I was taking so long with my decision. He, he was telling the car owner to, uh, to find someone else to off the ride to, because I was just dragging it out. And, uh, you know, I obviously made the decision to go and, uh, it's worked out. <laughs> tremendously for all parties involved. And, and one of the best things that came from it was, you know, most of the guys from my 52 team were actually able to come with me and find a home on two. So, um, so that kind of made the decision all the more better for me. Yeah. I was going to let you know that it has worked out pretty well. If, if you hadn't figured that out yet. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not yeah. too shabby for it's sure. Okay. It's okay. You know, we, we did, somehow we didn't win a championship last year. So, I mean, we got, we could do better. Phil Moran, he is like just a, a mechanical genius and has been around modifieds for a long time. So Kobe is a darn good race car driver, but it's kind of like, you know, Jimmy Johnson, good race car driver, but it took check and Alice to make him, you know, what he is. And to some degree, I would say the same thing about you and Phil Moran, but I, I am looking at social media a little bit, Kobe, and, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you about this a little bit. Art Jensen actually just came in. It's a great race, Doug. Watched live on Fans Choice TV. Sure glad I didn't miss that one. 
uh, and that was a BS call on NASCAR. But, you know, and I saw this the other night, you know, a little uh, conversation, and, and sometimes, you know, I don't know about, you know, printing all this stuff, but there was, a, you know, a, a quote uh, from you uh, on Matt Weaver's Twitter uh, from Saturday <laughs> night. Uh, when do I drop to the rear, Kobe asked, after pace laps. Uh, and, and you said, when do I give a certain group the middle finger? Uh, what was that all about? And, and obviously you you got the helmet strapped on, so you're a different person. You know, what do you think about it as a Monday morning quarterback situation? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, one of the things I think people forget about me is that I'm uh, really a huge fan of our series, and I'm a fan of Modifieds, where our place is in all of racing, because I think we have a great product. I think we have great cars, teams, drivers, and crew chiefs, and nobody can ever say that I only think about myself and my team, because I try my best to always talk very highly about who we have and, and what the product is that we put on for race fans to watch, and uh I'm very critical of our rules and our rules packages and our race procedures to make sure that that it's uh, fair uh, and that the fans understand what's going on. And what happened at Myrtle Beach was after the pit party, NASCAR, I was the, the poll winner, obviously. So I was the first car to pull off after the pit party. And I had to I was told to follow the NASCAR uh, truck to where they wanted us to stage. And they, they took us behind the backstretch wall at Myrtle Beach, which is a strip of paved asphalt that nobody drives on because we all pull in onto pit road, which is further down on the backstretch. And we pull in, we go and stage, and then right before the race, Phil looked at the left front tire and saw a nail sticking straight into the tire. And we called the NASCAR officials over. They saw it, and they confirmed it, and they were radioing to the tower that it was there. Uh, we pulled it out in front of the officials and the tire immediately started losing all of the air. And so obviously we had to change the tire and, and the decision is, you know, do you, do you make the pole sitter go to the rear for having to change the left front tire or do you let him keep his spot? Because as a series, you were the ones that made us drive through, uh, it was essentially the junkyard part of the speedway. And there was no discussion about it. The immediate response was, you're going to the rear for an unapproved tire change. And I was, you know, Phil obviously was really fired up about it. And, you know, in situations like that, you've got, you've got race fans watching the pole sitter drop to the back of the field. Nobody knew why. The announcers didn't know why. Nobody watching on Fans' Choice knew why. And it just looks really confusing, and I think it looks really bad for the series. So, um, so my comments you know, on the radio at the beginning part of the race and even after the race and post-race interviews, I, I pretty much stand by everything. Um, I, I think it's a bad decision. I think that it was a judgment call that could have gone in a favorable direction for a team. And it doesn't matter whether it's my team or you know, John McKennedy or Tommy Catalano. Um, and I think what they should have done was just told everybody, you know, this was shit luck and shouldn't have happened. And, you know, we're going to let the two car change the tire and start up front. So how vindicating was it for you to go to victory lane then after all that? Uh, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's a good story, I guess, you know, and it, it makes it something that we'll remember. My team will remember for a long time. Um, it, I still don't think it should have happened that way. You know, um, I, I got caught up in a, a lap 25 wreck, which also blew my top because Saw I can't that. believe with how much we're all conserving and saving tires that there's any contact with anybody at lap 25, of 150 lap race. Um, I got pushed up into the wall and actually hit the wall with the right side of the car pretty good, but I luckily hit it square and didn't bend anything. Um, so I guess the, the, the theme is, you know, I, I don't think it should have happened the way it happened. The, the fact that we won the race, shouldn't overshadow the fact that it was a bad decision and it could have had some pretty important consequences for uh for not only myself but for other competitors too they should have just let us change it and let us race and um i really believe that anybody who thinks otherwise isn't thinking for isn't thinking i think the only people that are going to think otherwise are the people that just hate me for the sake of hating me just like i hate Duke for the sake of hating Duke. so there's the, <laughs> the full story circle of, of, of the whole thing so did you have the opportunity to talk to nascar after the event and, and if not you know will you take that opportunity as as one of the statesmen for the modifies to to clarify something in case something like this happens again uh, I did not actually have a chance to speak to anybody after the event. I had a lot going on with uh, interviews and whatnot, and then I went over to the tech area and 
by that point, the car was ready to go back to the hauler, so I just went back and loaded it up. So I don't know. I'll see if Jimmy Wilson gives me a call or shoots me a text this week. I mean, if, if they uh, they have any questions, obviously, they know how to reach me. And, and I guess if I don't hear from them, yeah, I, I'll reach out to them. I have a good relationship with those guys as much as, you know, I can say what I want to say on the radio. And uh, Jimmy and I have gotten into it before. Um, Jimmy knows that my uh, my my opinions on some of the rules of our series are generally – uh, meant with good, you know, having good intentions behind them. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's something that I think needs to be brought up. Uh, they tell us all the time at driver's meetings that there's judgment calls in, in our sport, you know, from whether you jump the restart or, you know, whether you pull that a line too soon. Um, and they also, you know, send out entry blanks with 30 cars on them. And then when 32 show up, they make the decision to start all 32, which is, I think is a good thing for, for the teams uh, that show up and we have full fields. Um, so I think that there's opportunities to also consider, you know, circumstantial situations and, and make it right, you know, and I, and I don't think they did. So that's, that's something that just needs to be worked on, you know, and it's a, our whole series is always a work in progress from a rule standpoint. And I just want to make sure that they, you know, don't let things like that go away and that they actually seriously consider that they, they could do a lot of different things. They could say, Yes, we're going to let them change the tire. They could ask all the other cars, all the other drivers, what they think should happen. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can handle it. And I just don't think the way it was handled was uh, was appropriate. And I think the way you're handling it, uh, very professional. And, and that's what I've always liked about you, Doug, is that uh, you have a little common sense to you. Uh, you talk it out. Uh, yeah, we get heated at times, you know, especially when you strap on the helmet. But afterwards, you know, uh, there there's a very uh, good sense about discussing it. Even if you want to state your opinion, uh, that, that's a good way that you do that. And I think a lot of young racers uh, need to listen to this interview right now that we're having about what could have been a really, really bad situation on Saturday night. But we got more questions coming in uh, on our social media. Yes, for you, Doug. And uh, Brandon is going to give you your next question from social media yeah doug we talked about this a little bit the other day um mike rainville wants to know if uh there are any full fendered opportunities truck k&n super late models whatnot that you would entertain and is any of that in your future that's a good question um you know it's it's pretty cool because i think at this point there are some opportunities it's just a matter of how much money i can come up with from a sponsorship package um i've gotten to know a lot of people from winning the championships um, and going to the banquet down in Charlotte, I've gotten to just, you know, interact with a lot of people, um, that run full fendered stuff. And I, there's definitely interest on my part. Um, the unfortunate thing is, you know, uh, there's a certain cost that comes with it. And uh, I can't say that at the age that I'm at, that sometimes it's worth what they're asking for. You know, if I had that chunk of money to invest in something, it, it might not be a a one shot deal in a race in a certain race car. So, um, but yeah, the opportunities are there. Um, I would really love to do some super late model races aside from the modified. Um, that's something that maybe my partnership with Ernest performance can help me out with. Um, you know, I think I'd really like to get into some of those bigger events that the super late models do. Um, because I do have full fender experience in my past and, um, that's, you know, I started running late models at Stafford and, uh, moved up into their pro stock division, which is similar to a super late model and ran that before I got into the, to the SK modifieds up at Stafford. So, you know, it's something that I'm just a driver. I like to be challenged. Um, I like to do different things. And I think getting into the full fendered stuff is, uh, it would be a good challenge. You know, it's similar to getting, uh, going from the modified into one of the midgets that I drive. And, you know, it's just a different, different type of car handles differently and you have to drive it different. So I'm looking forward to any opportunity that presents itself. I'd love to see Kobe actually in a uh, full fendered car once again. Uh, I brought Ryan Priest down to the Snowball Derby years ago, and uh, he ran for my team there. Kobe, if I had a, a super late model still, we'd be talking. But I finally got <laughs> smart and got away from the car owning side. So I have. Um, yeah, you got out of that quick, Bob. Smart man. <laughs> yes, yes. Bob, I have all the phone numbers for all the chassis builders in my phone here. Yes. If you need it, buddy. Engine builders, too. Hmm. I have Which way too. to go? I'm not sure. Anyway. Uh, Ricky will be here to tell us in a minute, yes, right? Yes, he will. Absolutely. He'll be coming up on the other side of the hour. Um, what we're going to do here, and Kobe, hang on one second, but just to let everybody know, we're going to go to a break shortly um, because Facebook has a two-hour time limit on Facebook Live. We're going to actually come down with our post, and we're going to go up with a new one. So that's what we're going to do here on uh, Speed 51 uh, with the Morning Bullring. But, Kobe, I want to talk a uh, very important question. 
as I always say, in case the LaJoy likes to pick on me for this. But the question is, who did you vote for last week on the trash talking poll? Who's the biggest trash talker, you know, in terms of modified racing in the Northeast? Who'd you vote for? Oh, we, lo- do, we got Kobe? Yeah, you asking me or you asking Brandon? That? I'm asking you. I, I'm the biggest trash talker, <laughs> man. I shouldn't have lost that, that vote. <laughs> You know, that was the Cup fans voting for Ryan. You know what I mean? And Justin, Justin and I were texting each other, joking about it. You know, it's, uh, you know, I think, I think I'm very strong on my ability to poke fun at both myself and at the other drivers that I interact with on Twitter. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Honestly, you or Justin Bonsignor is who I would have voted for. I saw Ryan Priest on there, and I'm like, no. No, that's Ryan's Ryan. too nice. He's too, yes. too, too politically nice. correct now. And yes. Just when it starts to get rough, you know, Ryan fades away. You know, Ryan <laughs> yes. starts off strong, and then all of a sudden Ryan disappears. And, uh, you know, he's, he's there at the start but not the finish. And, you know, that's I, I, I was just going to make a really good joke about that, but <laughs> just leave it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, your famous dog is not going out in the snow anymore, is he? Uh, no, the snow's all melted up here, man. I came back from, from the trip down south, and there's no more snow. So, you know, it, it is early still in the, in the winter. We usually get a couple more snows here in Connecticut by the beginning of April. So I may have some more uh, snow carvings to, to display on Twitter. And listen, Bonsignor had nothing on you, okay? I'll say that because his response to you was just an ordinary dog pooping, honestly, that he stole off the Internet som- somewhere. You actually had something original. So, dude, you know, you won the war. <laughs> nah, the war's just started. These are little <laughs> battles, you know what I mean? These are the mini battles as part of the war. So uh, we'll, we'll see. It's just good fun, you know. Well, good start to the season for you, Doug Kobe. We appreciate you coming on the morning boring, and best of luck to you, dude, for the rest of the year. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. And uh, next time, you got to let me know if Brandon's co-hosting so that I can come up with a list of questions for him. Hey, oh. hey speaking of questions, I yeah. have one more before you run. Okay. What happened after the race? Tell us about that. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, uh, you know, I, it, no, nothing it, in retrospect is nothing big, but I go down the backstretch into turn three, and I'm, you know, talking to my crew on the radio, and I got dumped by Craig Lutz going into the corner, um, got spun around, and then backed it up into him, you know, up pretty hard actually i probably bent the rear end tube uh by getting into him and uh you know i guess after the race they came over and they apologized right away and um i i I thought that i had put him a lap down and that the race was over at the start finish line but uh, i didn't actually pass him until going into turn one so they still had to complete the race and they had a brake pedal problem so uh bottom line is no harm no foul uh i was really really pissed off at the time um, <laughs> you know, it's uh, something that I like to have happen after a race, but I kind of understand a little bit about what happened. But, uh, no big deal. On to, on to South Boston. Absolutely, and go. we'll see you there with Speed 51. Uh, congratulations and best of luck, dude. Yeah, thanks, guys. See you later. You got it. Doug Kobe, the winner for the NASCAR Wheel of Modified Tour season opener this past weekend at Myrtle Beach Speedway. And by the way, as a guy that talks on the air, I can go only go by what I'm told. And last week I was told there's a limit on Facebook. Apparently there is not, so I'm wrong. We're not breaking the Facebook signal. Okay, Mark Keeler says we can go four hours strong. So that's what we're doing here. But we will take a quick break. Tell everybody, Ricky Brooks coming on our show, of course. He was the center of discussion this past weekend at the Rattler at South Alabama Speedway. A lot going on in super late model racing for sure. Everyone's talking about it. There's a lot of people that don't want to talk about it, but the bottom line is people are talking about it, and we'll discuss it with Ricky Brooks next year on the Morning Bull Ring. This week, Brandon Shepard, he wins all four World of Outlaws events. Scott Bloomquist! A big win in the Pro Late 100 tonight. Timmy McCready in the World 100. Chase Purdy wins! Speed 51's video network, where the battles are legendary. Get the full picture on short track racing. We'll take you behind the scenes. Um, He's just a meathead. He's always the same way. Your track, your driver, your sport, 
your passion. Dirt, late models, modifieds, and more. Race highlights, recaps, interviews, and thousands of on-demand videos. Speed 51 Network, short track racers home for the best video coverage. Hey race fans, download the new speed51.com app today. Breaking news, feature stories, the unfiltered podcast, live race coverage, schedules, and more right at your fingertips. Download it today on iTunes and the Google Play Store. Welcome back to the morning bull ring. 9 a.m. on the point here. We have 30 minutes left in this show. I'm Bob Dillner, Brandon Ernest, who is checking out his phone right now. He's getting some text messages. You know, you're getting some uh, social media. Ernest Performance, by the way, he said, oh, you got to see the logo here. You got to see the logo. Ernest Performance. Yep. Uh, actually dialing, dialing in a lot of shocks uh, for super late model modified competitors around the country. You enjoying yourself here on the morning bull ring? I am. This is good. This is good. I enjoy it. So, so are we going to have you on the 51 Unfiltered podcast when it returns sometime this year? Is that ever going to come back? It I've been is. waiting. I know. So have I, honestly. But yes. uh, you know, we've been so darn busy that uh, we haven't been able to do it. But it's coming back shortly. Yes. We've got a lot of draft discussion to talk about. I think we're going to have you on there for that. I've already said my piece. No, no. There's more people to talk <laughs> about. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in. I like it. I think it's a good idea. I love the draft. The Rattler this past weekend, South Alabama Speedway. Big win for Giovanni Bramani. Uh, Anthony can't be racing. Uh, when you were watching that yesterday on Speed 51, uh, what were you thinking as he was coming to the checker? You know, honestly, what I was thinking watching it is, you know, you have Ty Majeski and Harrison Burton and Bubba Pollard and, and, and Gio, of course, watching it. And I'm just watching it, and I'm, I'm watching the, the, the Facebook comments and everything that's going on, and I'm like, how can people not be excited about this? Right. I just don't understand. There were naysayers? Yes. Who? Why? I'm not calling them out by name, but there were, there were a few comments that what were What were they saying? Oh, well, it's getting spread out now, and, you know, this thing's like this. It's going to be a boring race. It wasn't. It wasn't a it great wasn't. race at the end. I mean, Harrison almost got to him. You know, bumped him a couple times, uh, but almost got underneath him. Couldn't quite do it. But you know, how can you say anything bad about the fact that a kid like Geo, with what he's been able to overcome, you know, basically breaking his back last year on a dirt bike, sitting out half the year, his first super late model race, comes back and wins the Rattler of all races. I agree completely. That's a story in itself. Against you know, what is it? Two out of the last three years, the number one pick in the draft. Yeah. I, I mean, that's impressive. And I think the kid's got a good future. Uh, Brandon Ernest thinks he is a possible sleeper number one pick in the short track draft. We'll go to Ricky Brooks on the PFC Performance Hotline right now. And Ricky Brooks, in terms of talent, where do you think Geo stacks up with the rest of the competition? He was pretty impressive on Sunday. Yesterday, he was, he was very impressive. So what do you think? I mean, what do you think about this young kid? You've seen him a little bit in the pro late model world and now in the super late model world. Is the kid as good as we saw yesterday at the Rattler? I believe so. Um, with the Anthony Campy team, I, they've uh, they've turned some heads, and I think they're going to continue turning heads all year. Well, if you look at what has happened over the course of the last week, uh, Giovanni Bramani, not the only thing we're talking about uh, on Monday morning here on the Bullring. You're the lead tech director, uh, you know, in, in terms of a lot of super late model races and racing in America. And we saw a ruling last week uh, putting a restrictor plate on the Hamner spec engine uh, that reduced the horsepower a little bit. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk, uh, both from Speed 51 with the parties involved. Uh, we thank you for doing the interview with Casey LaJoy this past weekend to kind of set the record straight on some of the things that we have heard. Justin Ortel from Hamner Racing Engines, J uh, Jeff Hamner, they've all talked about this. But I think the biggest thing, Ricky, first of all, just to kind of clear the air a little bit, in terms of the horsepower, um, there's been so much talk about the horsepower and the discrepancy of that from one make to the next. You know, can you reveal those numbers? Because I think at this point, people really want to know if there's that much discrepancy. What was the horsepower difference in your test from those engines from the Snowball Derby? Well, unfortunately, in today's society, with the hype and social media, we can't be politically correct. 
to word a decision and keep it from tarnishing a person's reputation from something that they've done, which goes beyond the guy, the strict guidelines and rules. The decision to place the restrictors on them come because he chose to change some parts in his engine of a sealed engine package without consulting with us and getting approval for those changes. Those were those changes added up to a total of 20 horsepower gain and 17 on torque. And, and throughout the entire RPM range, from the original got the specs that we had and in dyno numbers, not over the total numbers, but throughout the RPM range, there's 30 horsepower and 30 foot pounds of torque throughout the entire range over what it was in 2011 when we downloaded those motors. So I, from what I understood, and I, I will not name any of the engine builders, but the range was 590 to 618. Is that accurate? Was the what now? The, the horsepower range from the lowest horsepower engine to the highest horsepower engine was 590 to 618. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So, so there was a discrepancy. Now, Hamner insists that, and I believe in a story by Matt Weaver, that he had said it was the intake and the O-rings or something like that. Um, were those the parts that he changed, and he claims that they were approved? Well, it, it, okay. It was the intake change. It was a rod length change. It was a piston change. Piston ring change and gas ports on the pistons, just to put it out there. Okay, so so we're the intake change was approved, but it was approved for alignment purposes only, no performance gain. So we took him on his word that it was no in, in, uh, performance gain. Okay, so you know with this seal program, um, you know obviously there is seals and 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 so forth that that you guys put out for these sealed engines. Uh, the test was done after um, you know the snowball derby. You know you related to uh, something that I either read or I listened to uh, through Speed Fifty One or maybe Short Track Scene over the weekend, and and both of those those uh, sources had some good stories. You know that saying that you know hey listen you know Hamner's got some options we got to talk you know they they may have to take their engines back and change them. Uh, I even heard you know change them maybe back to the way they were in 2011. You know have there been any checks on these engines since that time? Or has the Snowball Derby been the only check? And it was it just the Kyle Busch engine that you have checked? Have you looked at other Hamner engines as well? Yes, I have. I've looked at one other engine since then, and it, it come right in line with the Kyle Busch engine. It's, it's not just a, a, the Kyle Busch engine that's been checked. 10-4. Now, now, we just needed to clarify that. But what about, you know, in terms of looking back to 2011, Ricky? And you and me have talked about a lot of different things. But as we analyze this, you know, has there been any checks, you know, over the course of the last several years with that Hamner product? And have they been by the guidelines up until this point in this last check? We have not pulled an en a Hamner engine since 2011. No, ten we have not. Ten four. So going forward, do you think we're going to see more checks like this to try to keep things on a more level playing field? Absolutely. Going forward, you'll see more. You'll see more motors coming out of cars. You'll see more motors tore apart, and um, it, it it will not go nowhere near what it has. Uh, up until this point, we didn't feel like we had an issue. At the Derby, when I pull motors, I never dreamed this would come about. Because the SEAL program is to keep us from staying at the racetrack late at night, tearing motors apart. You got to put... The reason those guys are... Uh, it's a privilege to have a sealed motor. Because we put trust in those builders that they're going to keep everything identical. It's like the... Uh, progressive engine package that package has stayed the same with just a few minor changes in 18 years that got approved but that horsepower on that motor stayed the same in 18 years to the t the mcgonagill motor 
he asked to change a camshaft. He brought it to me. We dynoed it. We checked it. It was spot on. So it got approved last year. We're not saying that if you have an issue with something, part, whatever, that it cannot be changed, but it's got to be done the right way. We got to make sure it's not going to get a, a competitive edge over the next guy. And I want to just set the record straight from our standpoint here at Speed 51. Um, even back to my super late model days, and Ricky, you know, used to tech my cars. Uh, we've had McGonagall engines. We've had Hamner racing engines. So there's no side in which we are taking with our questioning or our stories or so forth and how we are covering this situation. You know, like you said, Ricky, social media uh, is just it just lit up and, and it could be a good thing and a bad thing. And most of the time, I think social media honestly is a bad thing because there's way too many negative comments on social media when we, sh we should be promoting the support. Um, and in terms of uh, advertising, uh, both Hamner as well as McGonagall have advertised on Speed 51 through its almost 20 years of existence. So there, there is no side that Speed 51 is taking on the, in, on the entire situation. We are just trying to figure out the story. And, and you know, I, I think, Ricky, a, a couple of other things that are interesting is the testing is done at Robbie White's uh, facility there in Tennessee. Um, you mentioned the fact that there is another engine builder that wants to get in, okay? And one of the comments that I've heard to me several times over the past weekend is they think Robbie White is that next person that wants to get in. Is that true? Absolutely not. The, when I made the statement about another engine builder that wanted to get it, uh, we, we could t uh, put it back into is – the option is to put that engine package back at PME where it was at with Hamner last year before this ordeal come about. Well, that is and it's been questioned to me over the weekend, basically putting question, questioning my trust and integrity and Robbie White's about the dyno and about taking the engine somewhere else, the dyno. Well, I've thought long and hard about that. And I'm not doing that. You know, pe people trust what I do and the, what I will do to satisfy those inquiring minds is they can hire a guy from Superflow to come in. He can calibrate the dyno. He can run the dyno. We'll just sit there in chairs and watch it. I think that's a good idea. You know, you, I'm, hey, listen, we'll even offer up if you want to, you know, be fair. You know, we could put the TV cameras there. I know you don't want to divulge numbers, but at the same time, uh, we would certainly more than offer to bring the Speed 51 cameras there as well to basically get rid of some of the naysayers uh, on this whole situation. The, the one thing that I honestly personally uh, was wondering, and we didn't get the opportunity to talk to each other prior to the Rattler, is that two days prior to people going to the Rattler. And I, I know you said it was not ideal. You know, did you ever give consideration to the fact that, and we heard that maybe this something like this was coming. Did you ever give consideration, or did the group give consideration, Ricky, to saying, hey, okay, listen, this is what we've found, and therefore in 30 days or in two weeks or whatever it may be, this is what we're going to do with the restrictor plate. You know, was there any thought to that, you know, instead of the two days prior to one of the bigger super late model, model races in America? Yes, there was some thought put to it, but if we had have done that, then you and I would be talking about right now about all the other racers that were pissed off and the engine builders that was pissed off of us not doing something going into the Rattler. But I've done my homework. I've done enough testing. The engine's wasn't down. Ask Harrison Burton yesterday. He said he felt like his engine was was equal. He just, he just his race car just wasn't good enough to to get there and make the pass. And that's so certainly give the kid credit for being honest. Certainly a good point for sure. Yeah, and Harrison Burton is one of those kids that. Um, really love super late model racing, go into the NASCAR big leagues, and, and we, we really appreciate the fact of how he approaches the game, not from a bad point or, or you, know, you know, just a vanilla point. He actually is a good speaker and, and a good ambassador for super late model racing. You know, the other thing that, that I think about with this deal, I know when I had my super late model program, honestly, to some degree, we would detune the engines almost every track that we went to. 
Uh, so is horsepower, you think, other than maybe qualifying or when you go to a bigger racetrack, is it that much of an issue, Ricky? For the most part anymore, a lot of people, they do not detune unless they go to like a quarter mile. The hmm. only time I think that the extra horsepower and torque helped is mainly during qualifying. When you got brand new tires, you can get all the power to the ground. And that's interesting. Is And three-eighths of a mile racetracks, Hickory Motor Speedway, we would detune it there. Uh, pavement, a lot of different factors that, that come into play. Uh, you know, I want to ask you this, too, just in terms of, you know, the, the testing and so far, forth. Uh, was the same carburetor and exhaust actually used on all the different engines or even uh, between the Hamner engines to do that testing? We use the same carburetor. We use the same headers. We use the same oil. We change oil in between running motors. And the engine builders are present, or a representative of theirs is present. And if uh, the car owner wants to show up, he can show up as well. This is definitely insightful, and I think it's very helpful to have you on the morning bullring because there was just a little bit of mystery uh, around a lot of things, Ricky, and a lot of questions were coming out. And I think sometimes, you know, even though I'm, I'm not a believer and everybody deserves to know everything, but when something as crucial like this uh, comes out, I, I think it's good. So if you guys ever want to get the message across right after you put out a release, we welcome you to give me a call and we'll go with a special version of a, a live feed to answer some of those questions. So maybe when you go to the racetrack, it's not as intensive for you. So we certainly, you know, invite you to do that. Use the SEAL group to be able to utilize Speed 51 to get that word out in the future to maybe just kind of put away some of those questions going into a weekend after a ruling. At the same time, you know, there was a lot of discussion about what's going to happen now to Hamner. Will the restrictor plate remain? Will they have to take their engines back? You referred to that in our interview that, who knows, you know, maybe something like that has to happen. Where do we go from here? The restrictors will remain unless we come up with a solution to get the engines down by changing a rock arm ratio or whatever, but... It will, it will remain in place until something can be come up with a decision with a group. And when I mean the group, everybody that was in that Monday meeting will, will, ha will be in that group. How many Hamner engines have you been told are on the market right now? I've heard, you know, two, 300 from you. I've heard 400 overall. Um, you know, how many engines are we talking about right now? I'd have to go back and look at my list. I'm not. I'm not 100 percent on on how many there there is, but um, the restrictor can stay on them from now on, and it's there. It's not a penalty. So that was a compromise, and and the restrict. The reason that we just didn't kick it out is because it's as big as it is, and the other engine builders agreed that it would be detrimental to the racer. You know, we look at, I look at dirt late model racing because obviously I've been in pavement for a long time and continue to be in pavement. I, I look at dirt late model racing and, and I look at the Lucas Oil late model dirt series, which I cover, and uh, their, their rules for the engines in that series is a half a page long. It's A through G. That's all it is. Um, you know, What's different in your mind between dirt late model racing where they can go with such simplicity and the pavement super late model world that we have? We're trying to keep the cost down. Uh, each engine package has a set of rules and guidelines, but those, those guidelines don't need to be published in, the, in a rule book because everybody involved has all those guidelines. It's it's almost it's almost like a crate engine, per se. Every engine's supposed to have the same stuff in it, and the guidelines for it. So I mean, I've heard people say, "Well, why don't you publish what's in these motors?" Same reason we don't publish uh, the dyno sheets. Their 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 engine builders has have asked us not to publish those numbers. 
because the four packages, the three seal packages and the parts motor package are not identical. We're not trying to match number for number on four packages. We're trying, we're trying to keep everything in guidelines of what we set as the guidelines back in 2011 when I pulled eight motors and we all dynoed them together. So super late model sealed engines right now. What is the price range? Because everybody has their own price, and I've, I've heard that. And, and just to give people that are watching and or listening today an idea, before this sealed engine program came out, and, and I was honestly with my team, I was one of the first, uh, probably among the first 20 to go to the sealed engine. McGonagill was my first choice of the sealed engine when I had my race team because I thought it was a great way to save some money. Uh, the prices of engines at that time for a built engine uh, were thirty thousand plus. I I had heard at one point there was one driver that had paid forty three thousand dollars. It could have been more uh, for some of the engines, and it was getting to be a hefty price tag. So it was commended uh, by this seal group to bring this seal engine in. Um, and at the time, I believe the price was seventeen five. Where do the engines stand right now, Ricky? 17.5 was, was basically a motor, I'm pretty sure, that was not fully dressed. Correct. Um, the max now on a fully dressed engine is around 24,000. But that's carburetor and all the front and dress. So in today's world, we're getting to price and stuff it's just like cars there's a lot of people that don't want to do anything when they pick up a race car they want to go to fury and roll a car in the trailer and not do nothing but go to the racetrack and get in it it's already lettered it's done everything people that want to race that way they're going to pay for it because people's not going to build cars for them for nothing so you got to be careful when, when you look at a price tag on something of, of how much did they want to do. It's like a crate engine for pro late model. If you, if you don't want to put the front pulleys and everything on it and dress it out yourself, then you got to pay somebody $50, $80 an hour to put that stuff on there. They can't, people can't work for free. So, that that's that's where these escalated numbers are coming from. Do you think moving forward, putting the restrictor plate on that Hamner sealed engine, is there any racetrack to, that you perceive it could be a disadvantage for them now with how that restrictor plate interacts with the horsepower and the torque curve and all of that sort of thing? Marching forward, do you think there is a track or two that could be a little bit more troublesome? for the Hamner engine with this restrictor plate? Absolutely not. I go to Irwindale uh, Friday, and in Irwindale, it will have a restrictor on it there. SRL tour, uh, the Southwest Spears uh, tour going to Irwindale Speedway out in California. We will be there with Speed 51. Uh, just before I let you go, Ricky, because honestly, to some degree, and obviously I could come up with more questions, you know, thereafter, after the show is off the air, uh, but but I, I believe I've covered what I need to. Is there anything else from your standpoint or the SEAL program, now that you have the platform right here for free for everybody to watch and listen to, is there anything else that you would like to add to this situation? People on social media just need to, if they're not involved and they're sitting on the couch and don't know what's going on, they just, they just need to just shut up because it, it, all it does is create a bunch of negativity for the racers and everybody involved. We need to promote racing. We don't need to kill it. I 100% agree with you. Social media, that, that veil of anonymity can certainly make somebody a hero or try, you know, feel like a hero for sure. So uh, I know Brandon Ernest and I, um, we are both, 
you know, taking an approach, and I've done it for several years, and I know you've done it here for the last little bit, um, taking that positivity approach on social media because there's just way too much negativity there. Ricky Brooks, we appreciate you coming on the Morning Bull Ring, and if you need anything from us to get word out there, certainly give us a holler. Appreciate it. Thank you. Ricky Brooks, lead tech director uh, for several different series and involved with that uh, sealed group that has the spec engine uh, and have come up with the rules for the spec engine. Of course, just to recap what went on uh, just prior to going to the Rattler at South Alabama Speedway last week, um, an announcement from the sealed group came out. A restrictor plate being placed on the Hamner Racing Engine out of Alabama. Jeff Hamner, a longtime engine builder. Uh, Justin Ortel, the new owner of Hamner Racing Engines, they reacted to it. Uh, that was actually that ruling was to bring the horsepower down on the Hamner Racing Engine after some dyno test from some engines that were taken from the Snowball Derby. Uh, it was not a reaction, uh, Brandon to Noah Gregson winning the Snowball Derby. Uh, it was something that was announced prior to the Snowball Derby in the driver's meeting that morning, so there was no singling out, uh, but still a lot of discussion on this. I, I know you don't care to really comment on the situation because you say you're not smart enough, but what is the one thing that you take out of all of this? Well, I think I think you just you know made a, made a very good point You know, to Noah Gregson's credit. I mean, here we are three months later, and people are still questioning his win. And, you know, the kid won the race. I mean, he took the trophy home, you know. And I don't see this as a reflection of anything negative to that. I just see it as, you know, just a checkup and where they're at. And, you know, whatever they decide to do going forward is, is you know, obviously, you know, what they decide to do. It's definitely not something that I'm, you know, qualified to speak on as far as the motor part of it goes. But, you know, I feel like we just have to trust that, you know, the right people will do the right things and it'll work out for everybody. I agree. Absolutely. Certainly a lot of talk about those engines at the Rattler this past weekend and Ricky Brooks coming on the show to address that situation. We appreciate him for coming on board here on the Morning Bullring. We're going to take a quick break here. We will probably go into overtime. We have one more guest coming up here on the Morning Bullring on Speed 51. Thank you so much to PFC Brakes for being the sponsor of our PFC Brakes Performance Hotline to call all these guests here each and every Monday morning, 7 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. on Mondays here on Speed 51. Every Monday morning, 7 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. on Mondays here on Speed 51. At least you can tell we were checking our feed and making sure the audio and so forth. We'll be right back here on the Morning Bull Ring. Off to commercial. We go. Take you behind the scenes. Um, he's just a meathead. He's always the same way. Your track, your driver, your sport, your passion. Dirt, late models, modifieds, and more. Race highlights, recaps, interviews, and thousands of on-demand videos. Speed 51 Network, short track racers home for the best video coverage. Hey, race fans, download the new Speed51.com app today. Breaking news, feature stories, the unfiltered podcast, live race coverage, schedules, and more right at your fingertips. Download it today on iTunes and the Google Play Store. Nine twenty-eight in the morning here. Uh, definitely an interesting conversation that we just had with uh, a member of the sealed group, Ricky Brooks, about the engine modification to the Hamner spec engine. 
uh, going into the Rattler at South Alabama Speedway. I'm Bob Dillner, Brandon Ernest alongside, and uh, I-, I was just sent a screen capture of Justin Ortel. I believe this is from Twitter, uh, and it's basically uh, an emoji with a, with a dude with his hand over his face and his eyes. I just can't believe in what he's hearing. Um, you know, everybody's got a little bit of an open forum. Justin Ortel has uh, made his uh, uh, words uh, known last week on a story on Speed 51. We recommend you go and search that in our little search tab in the upper part of the screen. Uh, we'll have certainly more stories to come about that as they become available. But we also thank Ricky Brooks uh, for coming on the show to talk about and discuss some of the issues, uh, some of uh, why the decisions were made and where we're going to go forward from here. The restrictor plate will remain on the Hamner Racing Engine, at least uh, for the uh, future going forward at this time. So that is the development this morning here on that situation. Now, back to the dirt. Uh, we had a, a big race weekend this past weekend. The Carolina Class Series kicking off its 20th season. Lancaster, you know, up north, we always call it. You know, a track up there, Lancaster. But down here, I was told immediately that it's Lancaster. Now, you're from Arkansas. What would you say with the spelling of Lancaster? I would say Lancaster. you gotta, you got to open your mic. <laughs> I would say Lancaster. Yeah, me too. Which is a racetrack everybody should go check out, by the way. Yes, absolutely. Up there in uh, near Buffalo, New York. A uh, really good racetrack. Well, but... I meant the one down here. Oh, Lancaster. <laughs> big, 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 Both of big, them. big half mile. There is no way that is a half mile racetrack. She's got some long straightaways. <laughs> so, so here's the deal. Uh, the first time I went to Lancaster, uh, South Carolina, I went with my wife and my son, and, and we went up on a little stand that they have right next to uh, the, the tower. And they came off of turn number four, and I'm watching them, and I actually had to go, way out here to see turn number one. I mean, yes. there is there is no way that's the same size as Martinsville. What do you think? I think it's probably pretty close. You think so? Yeah. Let's ask Michael Brown. Too. Let's ask Michael Brown. First time caller here on the morning bull ring. Uh, congratulations to you with your big win there. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. On Saturday night, uh, I need a sip of water. Uh, but uh, great win. But do you think that's a half mile, Michael? Because it seems a little bit bigger for me. Sometimes I uh, I begin to wonder. Uh, sometimes it ends, you think the straightaways are never going to end. <laughs> Absolutely. You talk about uh, needing horsepower. <laughs> you need horsepower for all sure. There, all of it <laughs> at, all of at it. Lancaster. That was your, that's your home track. Uh, so to do what you did, uh, win the Carolina Class race, uh, won a crate race there Saturday night. What was that like for you and your family? It was it was huge for me. Uh, you know, in, in victory lane, I, I got kind of choked up there. You know, you work your your whole life to get to that position, and you know, and and when your dreams finally come true and you win in front of your hometown crowd, it just uh, it really means the world to me. You know, in in a league of their own, they ser- they said there's no crying in baseball, Michael. There's no crying in dirt track racing. Don't you know that? <laughs> I know, man. I tell you. I- I had to take a couple of pauses there. I was like, "Man, this is this is bad." I'm trying to trying to thank my sponsors and, and hold it together, and just I don't know, you know. I I got to thinking about it when when I crossed the checker flag about you know really all the sacrifices that my family made, my dad made to you know to pretty much spend every dollar he ever made to you know to get me to the point to where I was seen to be able to drive for for people and. You know, it just really hit home when, you know, he was there to celebrate it with me. Well, that is definitely an awesome moment for sure. I've been watching you since the legend car ranks out here at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. Um, I watched the highlights, and they are posted now. Of If you're a premium ne- member of the Speed 51 Video Network, I watched them yesterday, actually. Mark Keeler and I watched them driving home from Indiana and uh, you were lurking there in third, had a couple of guys in front of you, some things shook out, some slower traffic got in the way. Uh, just paint the picture for us from your standpoint. Heck, Chris Madden was right in front of you. We all know how good he is to beat the guys that you beat on Saturday night, and how you got that lead was pretty interesting. Yes, sir. I mean, uh, you know, in this in this sport, you know, you got to be good, but you also got to have some luck on your side, and um, Chris fell out there, not not sure um, what had happened to him, but he pulled low coming off of two there, and 
and pulled into the pits and then that gave me the uh second place position and um you know i was really starting to worry there uh, brett was kind of pulling away from me and i was doing about everything in my power to to try and catch him and then um we had a caution and uh, then he jumped out on me again and you know then i was at that point, I just started saving my equipment because I knew I wasn't going to run him down. So I just started saving my stuff until um, I seen one of his uh, spotters show him the sticks where he had a big lead. And when I seen him do that, he started slowing down and running the bottom again. And, and when I seen that, I knew that was my opportunity to just give it everything I had. And, and that's what i done. I just went to the top and just give it everything it had. And, and luckily right when i caught him we caught lap traffic and um he went to the bottom and i just blasted the top and, and got the lead and, and the rest was history so it all worked out for me and i'm thankful for that it was fun watching that move for sure on the speed 51 video network those highlights from the carolina clash race at lancaster speedway michael why do they call it lancaster when it's spelled lancaster i have no idea i had some uh some guys back that I, I race legends cars with from from up north and stuff that would come down here and hang out and, and we used to mess with them all the time of, about calling it Lancaster. I don't <laughs> I don't have any idea where Lancaster. I don't I don't see where the G is in it, but. <laughs> It's just the way I was raised to say it, so we just roll with it. That's right. Roll with it, baby, for sure. And uh, it's a fast racetrack indeed. Um, you know, I, I want to talk about this team that you're running with right now because last year, at the beginning of the year, you had a different team. Uh, you got together with these boys late in the season last year. How did that all come about, and is that where we're going to see you for the rest of this year in, in terms of the super late model racing? Yes, sir. Um, that's, that's the plan as of now. Um when uh when me and the uh two four D team kinda kinda went our separate ways, um Billy Hicks was on the way home from the beach and, and me and him had a phone conversation and you know, the rest was kinda history. We put, you know, put a, a plan in place and, and he's held up to his end of the deal and, and you know, things are starting to uh to get going, you know. Um, the middle power to last year and, and towards the end of the year, um, we had some strong runs, but, you know, wasn't victorious like we wanted to be. And, you know, we're still trying to build that notebook and, and you know, trying to uh, do better at, you know, telling him what I want and, you know, just things like that that you just have to kind of smooth over to, uh, you know, to, to get those big wins. It's, uh, it's definitely not easy. So I saw you run the Hicks car there at the Blue Gray race at Cherokee last year, and you had a good run going there uh, and were a threat to steal the victory, uh, but didn't get it done on that day. Are we going back to March Madness this Sunday at Cherokee? Yes, sir, man. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. That one was definitely a, uh, definitely a heartbreaker just to have, you know, the car we had to set fast time and, win my heat race and, and start from the, the front row and and be in contention, you know, there until, um, you know, I had that flat right rear. It's definitely a uh, – definitely not the breath out of me, and I just – hopefully um, we can go back with the same notes that we used there and, and uh, put the 79 on the pole again and hopefully get the win this time. They call Cherokee the place your mama warned you about. Is it as intimidating from a driver's standpoint as the nickname says it is? It is. I, I think uh, when when I first come onto the dirt scene from asphalt, it is definitely by far the the hardest track in the Carolinas. I feel like to get a win at. I mean, and even in you know the support divisions from the four cylinders up, it's just um, you know I don't I don't know what it is about the place, but the, the competition there is just unbelievable. It seems like it's just like in a flat-out style race. You know, you're barely off the gas and you're back on it. Does it take a different style of driving to get that done there as comparison to some of the other tracks around this area? It does to a sense, but you could kind of, you know, in a sense compare that to what the, uh, the cup drivers is kind of saying about this new package they have. It's just... It depends on the car a lot because, like you said, it is so wide open. You know, it's you know, it's not like you have to use any sort of finesse, so to speak. I mean, there is some to it. Don't get me wrong, 
on the longer races, but it is, you know, for the most part, especially early in the night, just everything you can give it and just hope your car turns like you need it and have, have the drive off you need. So it, it definitely is it demands a lot out of the car to be good as well. So last year, we thought you were going to run for the Carolina Class Championship. You won the first race of the year. Obviously, the Ultimate Series is around this area as well. We've seen you venture out to some of the other shows. You know, what is in the cards for this year from downtown Michael Brown? You know, we, we've we bounced both of it off of our heads and stuff. And, um, you know, we were really going to run the, uh, the Ultimate Series points, but um, you know, it just, some of the races is, you know, five plus hours away and only paying $4,000 and things like that, you know, so, uh, from a financial standpoint, it, you know, Billy just kind of decided that, you know, we just hit all the races that, you know, are, are around here that pay really good money. So that's, as of now, that is our, our plan. Just, just hit all, you know, all the races within you know, three hours, that pays really good money. Ten four. Well, Michael Brown, it, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Um, you know, you're a gentleman for sure. I've been watching you for a long time. I was so happy to see you win that race on Saturday night. And uh, certainly we'll see you Sunday at Cherokee. It's going to be a lot of fun to check you out there and uh, see what you can do against some of the big competition coming in from the Southern All-Star Series. Yes, sir. I appreciate you having me and, and everything you do for the the dirt world it uh it truly means a lot to be able to uh hop on the internet on sunday mornings and and watch what i've done wrong and what i could do better to improve <laughs> so it, it certainly means a lot to all of us i'm sure hey at least you get to learn something that's the bottom line michael brown uh thanks for joining us on the morning boring and uh see you at march madness by the way are you a basketball fan are you paying attention to march madness in the tournament not at all <laughs> not one bit <laughs> You just made my buddy Brandon Ernest like with me a I very, like a very lot. happy. Well, anyway, just go with me and say go Tar Heels. That's all you need to say, okay? Go Tar Heels. There you go. <laughs> Michael Brown, we'll see him Saturday, actually Sunday, at Cherokee Speedway for March Madness. That will be a pay-per-view broadcast on speed51.com. So check it out. If you can't get to Gaffney and you need to go to the place your mama warned you about, who knows, depending on what Brandon's doing this weekend, I might take him down there with me and uh, to hang out a little bit, watch some good dirt late model racing. Uh, but good show. And, and like a comment that we just had, actually, and, and this is really kind of cool. Art Jensen said, great show. I chase dirt. Also, uh, you know, loves pavement, loves the Lucas Oil Late Model Dirt Series. Uh, he was brought up on northern uh, asphalt modifieds on the East Coast, but he goes out as far as Iowa. Man, we, we should hire Art because that's what we're about, 100% short track racing, and we've had dirt and pavement talked about on the show here today. I agree totally, and we should bring that guy in. This sounds like a really good, uh, really, really good mindset to have, right? That's the way we should all be. Absolutely, uh, more short tracks. Just uh, more short tracks in general. And, yes. And our T-shirt says, "Pavement or dirt doesn't matter." Doesn't matter because that's where the action is at. Bottom line. I totally line. agree. You know, uh, a lot of talk about you know Fontana. <laughs> Very boring. Very boring. NASCAR commend them for trying things. Absolutely. Um, is it working? Maybe not. Uh, verdict is still out. It's a work in progress. It is, and I'm sure they're going to be making some decisions and changing some things. But the bottom line is, when we get to Martinsville, when we get to Bristol, when we get to Richmond, okay, forget about that package. It's going to be some good racing, and that's what short track racing is all about. And, folks, you can see that style of racing Friday, Saturday, Sundays at your local racetrack, whether it's a regional touring series, a national touring series, dirt or pavement, whether it's a weekly 